and Intergovernmental Affairs. Members met on Capitol Hill Thursday to consider reform of the Food and Drug Administration's drug approval process. Over the next three hours, you will hear testimony offered by FDA Commissioner David Kessler and other representatives of the FDA, representatives of the Public Citizen Health Research Group, and Bruce Burlington from the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Subcommittee on Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations of the Government Operations Committee is now in session. An important part of the subcommittee's work involves oversight of the Food and Drug Administration. The subcommittee is ever watchful of efforts by parties in and out of government to exert undue influence on FDA decision making. In the past, the subcommittee has documented many cases where FDA succumbed to pressure from the Office of Management and Budget. In the current administration, a major source of influence appears to be the Council on Competitiveness, chaired by Vice President Quayle and charged with reviewing all federal regulatory activities. The Quail Council, like OMB, operates in secret, behind closed doors. The nameless and faceless staff of the Council go about the business of reviewing federal health and safety regulations. The one thing Mr. Quail has not tried to hide is his view of the Council's mission. Just a few weeks ago, he warned any federal agency that acts too aggressively for White House tastes that, quote, they've met the enemy and it's called the Competitiveness Council, close quote. Last November, Mr. Quayle and FDA Commissioner Kessler announced a series of so-called reforms of the drug approval process. Some of the proposals are not controversial and deserve support. Unfortunately, the White House has ignored one such proposal more resources for FDA. The President's budget fails to provide any additional resources for FDA's drug review activities. <clears throat> Other quail proposals raise significant public health concerns. These include pla pa placing severe limits on FDA's ability to scrutinize drug applications by farming out drug reviews to outside groups and a plan to permit new drug trials to begin on human volunteers without FDA review. Experts in and out of government are concerned that the public health may suffer if FDA fully implements all of the Quail Council's reforms. Our preliminary investigation suggests that many at FDA also have serious misgivings about the Quail proposals, but have been overruled by the White House. I know that Commissioner Kessler shares my vision of a strong and independent FDA. In fact, he recently stated that, quote, today's FDA 
isn't at the mercy of external forces. We are setting the agenda. It will not be set for us." Close quote. We will pose questions at today's hearing that will help us learn whether the Commissioner's description of an independent FDA is accurate. Is FDA being permitted to make critically important decisions about the future of the drug appro approval process solely on public health considerations? Or is FDA being forced to implement the quail proposals only because a political gun is aimed at its head? These questions go to the heart of FDA's ability to fulfill its congressionally mandated public health mission. For if FDA is being held hostage to the political desires of the White House, then the public will continue to lose faith in the ability of the agency to do its job. Before we proceed, I want to make a comment about the subcommittee's investigation that led to today's hearing. Last October, under orders from the White House, FDA withheld documents from the subcommittee. In November, the subcommittee was forced to issue a subpoena for these documents. Under subpoena, FDA provided us with all the documents finally requested. There is no question that the Congress is entitled to these types of materials. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Our first witness will be Dr. Sidney Wolf, Director of the Health Research Group. We will then hear from FDA Commissioner Dr. David Kessler, who is accompanied by other FDA officials responsible for implementing the Quail Council recommendations. Before we hear our first witness, however, I would like to yield to our distinguished ranking minority member, Mr. Craig Thomas, for any remarks he might like to make. Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, let me thank you for holding this hearing. The drug approval process is an issue, of course, that deserves our attention. The first priority of the federal government is to protect the interests of individuals. We provide a common defense to protect from foreign aggressors. We create laws to prevent criminal and civil violations. We create a regulatory process to allow our citizens to achieve their goals and protect them from harm. It's the last point, of course, that we address today. There's great concern in this country about health care. We have held several hearings within this subcommittee over the years to deal with health problems, quite a number as a matter of fact, such as AIDS, Alzheimer's, and tuberculosis. We're told that we have to develop more effective treatments and bring them to the market faster and less expensive to help the people who have an immediate need. At the same time, the Congress has created a regulatory bureaucracy that has slowed this process. FDA has not received an adequate level of finance, personnel, or facilities resources to move on faster approval. It can now take between 8 and 12 years from the time a new drug is developed until it gets on the market. With the exception of AIDS drugs, which have now been approved in as little as 8 months, we can expect the approval process to take within 2 to 3 years if human tests are allowed. Food and Drug Administration, working with the Vice President's Competitive Council, looked at this problem and developed a series of policy recommendations. They were designed to maximize the current process for FDA, to utilize the wealth of knowledge both in and out of the agency, and to protect the health and safety of consumers. All of these recommendations have been proposed in previous studies dating back to 1977. Some of the recommendations will require Congress to enact legislation, while still others can be accomplished with administrative changes. They are now subject to the same regulatory process, review process, as all other policy decisions, including public comment. Everyone, including public interest groups, Citizen advocates, private sector, and the victims of many diseases will have a chance to debate the merits of these proposals. Public advocacy groups will hopefully use this opportunity to work with the agency and the industry to ensure the needs of those affected with these diseases will be helped. Many organizations representing groups suffering from specific diseases have already voiced their support for these recommendations. Congress will have a chance to deal with the recommendations by debating needed legislative actions. Neither the FDA nor the Vice President's Office have maintained that these changes should occur without congressional approval. The FDA will retain oversight responsibility and control of the review and approval process, but will have limited resources freed up to deal uh, with more issues and applications. The pharmaceutical industry, one that is uh, uh, competitive in the international markets, uh, one of the few in our sector, will be able to control the costs of their products and shift resources to deal with other illnesses. Mr. Chairman, this is an example of how the system should work. After vigorous debate, a series of policy recommendations have been made with the goal of protecting numerous interests, but mostly the interests of patients. The Vice President and the Commissioner of FDA should be congratulated on their efforts. 
We should resist the urge to torpedo the products of this process simply because we are sore at the agency or don't like the pharmaceutical industry or don't like the vice president. They've developed a group of recommendations that have received deserved praise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Let me now call on a distinguished member from Connecticut, Mr. Laura. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to also thank you for holding this very important hearing on the Vice President's Council on Competitiveness Activities concerning the reform of FDA's approval process. The documents that the subcommittee has obtained from the FDA clearly demonstrate that what has transpired over the past two years amounts to nothing less than political sabotage of the drug approval process. From the beginning, the FDA and outside health experts raised serious concerns about the Council's recommendations, but these concerns were brushed aside as the Council rushed headlong down the path of deregulating the drug approval process. While deregulation is a laudable goal in many respects, the proposals of the Council on Competitiveness simply go too far. They make it impossible for the FDA to fulfill its mandate, which is to approve only those products that have demonstrated, that have been demonstrated to be safe and effective for general use. For instance, the policy of relying on non-governmental entities to review drug applications, which is now being implemented, will make it extremely difficult for the FDA to verify the accuracy of data or to recognize conflicts of interest. And the insistence of the Council on expanding the FDA's proposal to expedite approval for life-threatening and seriously debilitating diseases to encompass any condition for which there is no alternative therapy shows an unconscionable disregard for safety concerns. I have no doubt that the FDA's drug approval process needs to be reformed and that expedited procedures for the life-threatening and seriously debilitating diseases are needed. In recent months, congressional hearings have uncovered cases of appalling mismanagement of the drug approval applications uh, by the FDA. One of the most notorious was the application for photophoresis as a treatment for progressive scleroderma. Although I do not want to dwell on the details of the photophoresis application, I feel compelled to mention that as we sit here this morning, hundreds and thousands of men and women across this country are suffering horribly as this disease brings on a slow and a painful death. Meanwhile, there is a promising new therapy available at more than 60 medical centers nationwide that could offer them new hope. But approval of photophoresis is stuck in a bureaucratic morass that has for now denied these men and women the opportunity to be treated. We must find a way to expedite the drug approval process for cases such as this, and I commend Commissioner Kessler and the FDA for attempting to find new ways to do this. But the way to reform the process is not to do away with it, as many of the Council on Competitiveness's policies do. The documents we have seen demonstrate that the FDA clearly recognized the threat that the Council's policy decisions posed, and to their credit, they voiced those concerns. However, the White House had the last word, and as a result, we are faced with the implementation of a clearly misguided policy. I would like to commend the subcommittee and the subcommittee staff for their thorough work on this matter, and I'd like to thank Commissioner Kessler and the other witnesses who will appear before us uh, this morning. I look forward to their testimony, and again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Loro. And now let me call on our distinguished member from New Jersey, Mr. Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, first of all, if you have any pills, I could use it for my throat. I know some pharmaceutical people are here, have a little laryngitis, and I, I'll pay for them <laughs> in cash. All right. The, uh, let me uh, say, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for calling this hearing to enable members of the subcommittee to examine the issues surrounding limitation of FDA's review of new drugs as recommended by the White House Council on Competitiveness, known as the Quail Council. Because concerns have been raised that the health of the public could be jeopardized by some of these proposals, it is very important that we fully evaluate each of the Council's recommendations. 
Mr. Chairman, a number of pharmaceutical companies are headquartered in my state of New Jersey. I want to do all that I can to see that the industry continues to, to thrive in their effort to produce successful medications to prevent and combat illnesses and to continue to employ people in our state. The 10th Congressional District of New Jersey, which I represent, is plagued by many of the health problems that afflict urban communities throughout the United States. In particular, the spread of the AIDS virus continues to take a heavy toll in American cities. Because time is of the essence in treating AIDS patients, it is vitally important that safe and effective medicines be made available as quickly as possible to patients who are HIV positive. However, I also think that we cannot afford to become lax where the issues of public health and safety are concerned. In recent months, a number of women have come forward with reports of great physical and emotional pain as a result of breast implants, which they thought were perfectly safe. The Food and Drug Administration has one of the most serious missions of any government agency because it literally deals with matters of life and death. So I think we should pro proceed with caution before making major changes in the FDA approval process. Mr. Chairman, thank you for calling this hearing. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Payne. And now our distinguished senior member, Ms. Mink. Whatever open comments you may care to make. Thank you very much. I was startled because I've not been called a senior member <laughs> over, over well, this, yeah, no, this, this retread experience that I'm <laughs> ongoing. But I appreciate very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, your initiative in calling and convening this very important uh, meeting to uh, analyze and uh, critique the recommendations that uh, could very well thwart the progress that has been made and endured over the years in protecting consumers with respect to safety and effectiveness of drugs. I uh, had my own personal uh, experience with uh, the uh, deleterious effects and, and hazards of uh, careless use of drugs and drug experimentation. So I well know the uh, importance of uh, strengthening and assuring the American public that whatever drugs are sold are safe and effective. And I hope that uh, as a result of these hearings that you'll be conducting, that we will be able to uh, offer substantial support and critique with respect to these recommendations that attempt to weaken the authority of the FDA. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Meng. Before we proceed now with the testimony, let me just uh, review the procedures of the subcommittee. As is the custom of the Government Operations Committee, all witnesses before the committee will be sworn in. From time to time during the hearing, we will be inserting into the record, without objection, documents relevant to this matter. I will also be inserting into the hearing record, without objection, materials related to the subpoena that the subcommittee issued last November as part of this investigation. Before we begin, let me say to our witnesses that uh, we, the full text of your written statements will be inserted in the hearing record, and we've asked you to summarize your testimony in 10 minutes so that there will be time for questions after each presentation. Uh, let me now welcome our first witness, Dr. Sidney Wolf, Director of the Public Citizen Health Research Group, uh, who has done truly outstanding work in the field of public health concerns. Dr. Wolf, thank you for taking time from your very hectic schedule to be with us. If uh, Mr. Wolfson is going to be uh, answering questions or testifying, I'd, I'd want him to also be sworn in. Be sworn in. Be sworn Just in. yourself? But we were, but we both of you? We okay. Both if you'll stand then and raise your right yes. hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. Let the record indicate that each of the witnesses has answered in the affirmative. And at this point, Dr. Wolf, I think we're prepared for your testimony. 
Before I go into the testimony, I'd like to introduce Paul Wolfson, who's Will an attorney. you turn the microphone very close to you because it's not sensitive at all? Before I start my testimony, I'd like to introduce Paul Wolfson, who's an attorney with the Public Citizen Litigation Group. Paul has worked very closely. Dr. Wolf, hold on a second. I don't think that mic is working. You don't think it's working? How about now? Not Still yet. not working. We'll get to you. Okay. This is not a medical device, so we there can't There you go. Here we come. <laughs> is it on now? No. It was briefly on, and then it went off, I think. The other mic. Uh, this one's working now. Okay. Right. Okay. There you go. Before I start the testimony, I'd like to introduce Paul Wolfson, who's an attorney with the Public Citizen Litigation Group, who's worked closely with us in our efforts to examine the legality of certain of these proposals, A and B, uh, to request a number of documents from the FDA concerning whether or not any of these have been implemented partially or at all in the past. I join the members of the subcommittee in thanking you for having this hearing and inviting us to testify on what is an extremely important issue. In the 20 years since Ralph Nader and I started this group, these proposals, particularly the three that I'll focus on, are the biggest threat to the safety of prescription drugs that we have seen in, in this country. What's especially ironic about the Council on Competitiveness proposals is that they come at the end of a dec decade during which there have been an unprecedented number of revelations of criminal or other negligent activities by the drug industry regarding the validity, completeness, or interpretation of data submitted in support of new drug applications. Such findings demand greater, not less, FDA scrutiny over the drug approval process. But given the significant campaign contributions to the Bush Quail campaign and to the Republican National Committee from the drug industry and its influence over the White House, uh, which we include in Appendix 1, nothing is surprising. Although the plan does discuss expedited review of drugs for life-threatening conditions such as cancer and AIDS, which the FDA has already been doing for several years and which is not a new plan, other aspects of the proposal are new and are sharp and dangerous departures from present policies. The three worst proposals are as follows, and I'd like to emphasize that in the three that we're discussing, there is nothing that would really arguably, according to anyone at the FDA, speed up the approval of either AIDS drugs or any other drug for life-threatening situations. First is elimination of FDA's role in decisions to allow human drug experimentation after animal studies are completed. As, as it is now the case, on completion of animal studies on a new drug, FDA has the responsibility for approval or disapproval of the commencement of the first phase of human studies, usually done on healthy people, except in the case of cancer and AIDS drugs. The new policy would eliminate FDA's ability to stop human experimentation by withholding approval of a new drug if animal studies showed it to be too dangerous for human use. The second proposal to which we strongly object is the farming out of the review of new drug applications to non-FDA reviewers. Another alleged reform states that, quote, to improve the efficiency of the FDA approval process, FDA will begin using experts outside the government to conduct clinical reviews for 8 to 12 drugs over a 16-month period, unquote. Many of these reviewers are likely to have financial and other links to the drug industry, which could endanger the objectivity of the drug review and thereby endanger American patients. And finally, U.S. recognition of foreign approvals. The White House plan will also, quote, enable the U.S. to re recognize foreign approvals of drugs, unquote. Emphasizing what a radical departure this plan is from present policies, the Council on Competitiveness states that, quote, at present, FDA does not grant automatic approval to a drug that has been approved in another country. FDA officials admit that no other country has the rigorous standards for drug safety and efficacy of the United States, which means that, by definition, reciprocity would result in lower U.S. standards. Thalidomide and dozens of other drugs approved in Europe but not approved here and which had to be pulled off the market in those countries after people were injured or killed are the kind of reason why we should not go with the standards of other countries. Because of concerns about certain of these proposals voiced by FDA physicians to us, whose, physicians whose job it is to review new drug applications, we conducted a survey of FDA reviewing medical officers last fall, shortly after the Council's proposals were announced. 
Responses were received from 47 medical officers, almost 40 percent of those to whom the questionnaires were sent. The findings, and briefly, are that 91.5 percent disagreed or strongly disagree with the plan to weaken the protection of human subjects of drug experiments by eliminating a key FDA protective role. 80.8 percent disagreed or strongly disagreed with the plan to privatize the review of new drug applications, and 83.5 percent disagreed or strongly disagreed with the proposal to lower the standards for drug approval by automatically approving drugs approved in another country. And I'd just like to spend a minute re reading a couple of the detailed responses that were sent in in addition to filling out the questionnaire. On the first question of the uh, removing FDA's role from regulating human experimentation, one physician said, quote, many if not most IRBs, institutional review boards, do not have the expertise to adequately evaluate the potential human risk in such studies. Lack of FDA involvement in the earliest phases of drug development is more likely to slow rather than to expedite the approval process. On the question number two, having to do with farming out of the review, one person wrote, the proposal would virtually preclude useful and valuable communications between different reviewing disciplines, as in medical pharmacology, biopharmacology, and other disciplines that are involved, include statistics and epidemiology, that cur currently form an integral part of the FDA review process. No external review organization's certification can ever preclude FDA's own further review on an as-needed basis. Waivers will likely be given to outside reviewers for certain conflicts of interest that would never be given for an FDA reviewer. And finally, a comment on the third question, the foreign standards. Quote, if the legislative bodies in the FDA have established a certain standard for drug effectiveness and safety, it is the right of the American people to have that standard upheld, no matter if other countries employ different standards. I am particularly concerned about being forced to accept certain unproven surrogate endpoints for drug effectiveness that may ultimately bear little relation uh, to clinical benefit. Not only were the FDA medical officers that respond to our survey almost unanimously opposed, but there was other opposition to these proposals. The most notable of which was from Dr. Charles Edwards, now director of the Scripps Clinic and Research Foundation in La Jolla, California. He was the FDA commissioner under President Nixon and more recently was the designated director of a blue ribbon HHS commission on drug regulation set up during the Bush administration. He is also strongly opposed to the three, to the three parts of the Consulate Competitiveness proposal that I've just described. He told me yesterday that the proposals are only a, quote, smokescreen, unquote, which politically sound good, but are designed to divert attention from the real issue, that of giving FDA the resources it needs to do the best job possible in regulation of drugs, something that Mr. Thomas mentioned, and we, I think we all agree on that. He further stated, that all of the three proposals were, quote, nonsense and idiocy, end quote, pointing out that all three in various ways were discussed but rejected by the Edwards Commission in its deliberations on how to improve the drug review process. I'd like to add that Dr. Bruce Chabner, as head of clinical trials for the National Cancer Institute, also told me that he thought removing FDA from the loop in terms of protecting human subjects was unworkable, and he also strongly disagreed with the use of outside privatized reviewers for new drug applications. As mentioned in the beginning of the testimony, the integrity of data submitted by drug companies to FDA has been increasingly questioned for its validity over the past decade. Examples of companies which have pleaded guilty to withholding safety data from the FDA include Lilly, the arthritis drug Oriflex, later taken off the market, SmithKline, the high blood pressure drug Celecrine, later taken off the market, Herxt, the antidepressant Meritol, later taken off the market. These three drugs alone injured or killed hundreds of people, and none would have been marketed in this country had their manufacturers not engaged in criminal activity to withhold important safety data. We have a timeout here. In addition to these completed criminal investigations with convictions, there have also been several current cases examined for possible criminal prosecution involving Upjohn, Halcyon, the sleeping pill recently banned in the United Kingdom, Pfizer, the Bjork Charlie heart valve, about which FDA has said that Pfizer, quote, has engaged in a continuing scheme to interrupt, deflect, and misdirect FDA's regulation of the Shiley convexo concave heart valve. The Shiley heart valve was defective from the time of its approval. Shiley secured approval by failing to reveal material information it had regarding the defect. 
There have been an estimated 670 deaths from this product so far. And finally, the Dow Corning for the silicone gel breast implants and Hoffman LaRoche for Versed, an anesthetic drug which the manufacturer knew was being marketed in a dangerously strong dosage form. In summary, we have never been more aware than now of the limits, including criminal activity, to which many drug and device manufacturers will go to obtain approval of their products. Strengthening FDA's ability to detect these problems as early as possible is an important priority. This includes efforts to expand FDA staff as necessary rather than the more expensive, less efficient, and probably more dangerous hiring of outside new drug application reviewers with the almost predictable conflict of, conflicts of interest they will have. In addition, FDA needs subpoena power so that the agency can much earlier, not only after plaintiff's attorneys obtain the evidence, find out what is really going on with respect to drug safety and efficacy rather than being forced to rely on the all too often laundered version of the data sent in by the companies. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Wolf. We've included with the written statement a copy of the questionnaire that was sent to the medical officers and uh, the full list of the kinds of responses that were received in addition to the numerical responses to the three questions. Uh, we'll try to use the uh, five-minute rule uh, during these early rounds of questioning. Um, the Council's external review directive, if fully implemented, uh, would prevent FDA from examining safety and efficacy data. Instead, FDA would make its decision solely on a report from an outside group that reviewed the data. What are the potential risks to the public if FDA cannot scrutinize data from applications that were reviewed by outside groups? Aside from the unique combination of skills such as chemists, pharmacologists, epidemiologists, statisticians that are not likely assembled anywhere in the world, uh, the conflict of interest issue is entirely different with FDA employees than it is with outside reviewers. In the most extreme form that you've just described, this would pose a serious threat to the public health. And it is for these kinds of reasons that we believe that this package of proposals, these three in particular, pose the biggest risk to the health of the American public with respect to the safety and efficacy of prescription drugs of anything that has happened during the 20 years since this group was started. You described Dr. Edward, Edwards as expressing very serious concerns about several of the quail proposals. You indicated that Dr. Edwards was the FDA commissioner under President Nixon and recently headed a blue ribbon panel appointed by President Bush and Secretary Sullivan to examine FDA. When experts like Dr. Edwards oppose the quail directives, what does this say about the possible risk to public health if the Council's plans are fully implemented? I think that the fact that Dr. Edwards correctly described that these kinds of proposals were discussed last year by the Commission and rejected, uh, amongst other things, means that they were rejected because the Commission felt if they were implemented, they would pose a threat to the public health. And Dr. Edwards telling me yesterday that he continues to believe that means that the commission that was set up to try and solve the very problems that uh, Congresswoman DeLauro and others have described felt that empowering the FDA with more staff was a much more reasonable way to go than implementing these proposals. So I think Dr. Edwards is saying now, and the commission said last year, these kinds of proposals, the three I've described, are a threat to the American public and should be rejected. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a number of questions. I'll try and do it quickly. I, let, let me say, first of all, you're a scientist, I presume, and, I, and you uh, move finally to talk about the merits of these. But I'm a little surprised that in your first paragraph, you, you highlight the s campaign contributions. Is, is, is yours a political statement, or are you talking about the scientific aspects of this issue? No, I'm simply, if you look at the appendix where this is detailed, we're simply pointing out that uh, just as 20 years ago there was a thinly disguised fundraising effort for a political campaign called the Campaign on Responsiveness, I, we think that certain elements of what are going on here. I mean, you've got an administration 
that asked for a Blue Ribbon Commission to come up with recommendations on how to approve the drug approval process that we both agree can use some improve, uh, improvement. And they rejected these three. And so one has to ask why if the administration's own Blue Ribbon Commission rejected these three, what other reason is there for these three being proposed by the Quail Competitiveness Council? And I think that a reasonable, plausible hypothesis is that this these kinds of things were the wish list of the drug industry. So this is simply a statement describing campaign contributions and describing how the administration has suddenly done a 180 degree bout face on what were their recommendations and accepted these three which were rejected before. Well I'm here and I think most of us are and I hope we are to take a look at a topic that is of great interest to lots of people and I hope we look at it and don't come in with the old Nader political thing and start with that. So I'm surprised you start with I, that. I don't know what you Could mean you by please, the old Nader uh, political thing. Well, so you, you, uh, you do know what I mean. No, I don't. What, so uh, if you'd do, like are you familiar with the lasagna report? Yeah. The, the Would you tell me a little bit about the general thrust of it and what it was designed to do? Well, the lasagna commission was set up initially to look particularly at drugs for cancer, and life-threatening situations uh, such as AIDS. And it turned out that the recommendations of the Lasagna Commission were men, men, some of the better recommendations, of which there were some, had already been implemented long ago before the Lasagna Commission ever came into existence by the FDA. Other of the recommendations, such as one to actually have the drug industry pay for doing outside review of drugs, is a lunatic idea and I think everyone in the FDA thought that it was a terrible idea. So all I would say in summary is that the few recommendations of the Lasagna Commission that were good ones had already been implemented long ago. The other recommendations were terrible recommendations and it's of interest that after the Lasagna Commission uh, the FDA and the administration was unsatisfied enough with the overall problem of the drug approval process that it set up a much more uh, Swoop, swooping, far-reaching, all-inclusive Blue Ribbon Commission headed by a former FDA commissioner to look into those issues. Dr. Zanya is what? Uh, director of the study for... Center for the Center study. Center for uh, Tufts. Right. And right. do you consider him to be knowledgeable? He's knowledgeable in some things, but in certainly in other, I mean, this center used to be at the University of Rochester and it received heavy funding from the drug industry. I mean, he's knowledgeable in getting funding from the drug industry, I would say that. Where do you get your funding? We are funded almost exclusively by membership contributions from 110,000 members. I see. May I, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit a letter that was sent to Mr. McMillan from Dr. Lasagna for the record, if I may. Without objection. Thank you. Order. What, uh, tell me when my time is over, what, what, do you think there ought to be uh, something done to reduce the time generally that it takes to uh, approve drug applications? For the small fraction of drugs, which is anywhere from 10 to 15 percent, that really are important therapeutic advances over existing drugs, absolutely, and I'm glad that over the last 20 years FDA has addressed these issues. And, had they more staff, they could address them even more. The majority of drugs are not for life-threatening situations and are not for conditions for which there is no other alternative treatment. And for those drugs, uh, I see no problem in their taking a long time to get to market since their benefactors are mainly the companies that manufacture them. There are certain elements of the Competitiveness Council proposals that make sense, which is, I think, sort of the question you're getting at. None of the three that I'm talking about make sense. The one that has to do with harmonization of the ways in which tests are done on animals and humans in various countries is a good idea. It's already undergoing, it's already being looked at carefully in the EEC as part of their own harmonization and uh, people such as Dr. Temple and Dr. Peck from the FDA went over to Brussels a few months ago to try and see if they can come up with some standard tests that everyone can do so that when a study is done in one country, it's done with the same methodology that studies are done here, and we can use, if they're properly done, uh, foreign kinds of studies, not foreign standards for approval, foreign studies. So there are some things that make sense. I just focused on the three yeah. that I don't think make any sense and which I think pose a threat. I understand to the that, and I, I, but I just would say to you, and I presume you agree, that, that 
number one, there's no sense in having an excessive amount of bureaucracy or hoops to jump through, then the costs are passed on to consumers, which your group usually represents. So I would assume that we're for finding a more efficient way to accomplish our goal. For the drugs that are really for important But you're not interested advances. in the others at all. That, well, it's the not that are not interested. I, don't th I think that if it takes an extra six months or a year for the 15th arthritis drug to get on the market, that there's no loser other than the company. And, and the you. purpose of the FDA is to protect the American public, to get drugs approved as quickly as possible that are an important advance in therapeutics. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Loro. Um, Dr. Wolf, one of the comments that you received in response to your surveys, a question about farming out the reviews to non-FDA uh, reviewers said, why not hire more internal reviewers and provide incentives to stay on board when their expertise um, matures? Uh, what I wanted to ask you about is, uh, and you mentioned that in your own testimony, um, do you know anything about what the cost of such a proposal would be? Has there been any cost estimates of, um, of that and what it would cost to hire more internal reviewers versus the hiring out process? That was one of a number of questions that we posed to the FDA in a Freedom of Information request uh, a couple months ago about any evidence that they have used in a partial review basis in the past some outside reviewers. So there is some experience and I would like to know what, I mean, what the answer is, just as you would. I cannot imagine, nor does anyone I've spoken to, uh, disagree with the idea that it will cost much more. It's interesting that in the last couple of weeks in the area of the biotech drugs, which are a different division of the FDA, they've admitted that the best way of easing the bottleneck is to hire more internal reviewers. Why, if that makes sense for one area, doesn't it make sense for the other, I don't know. So I think that I mean, implicit in your question is that the best remedy is to enlarge the size of the staff that they already have with those kinds of people, with those kinds of conflict of interest uh, protections. I think that's the only way to go. It's certainly what the recommendation was uh, of the Edwards Commission. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, in, in your statement also, you state that we need greater and not less FDA scrutiny over the drug approval process. Uh, have you thought through or what specific areas uh, where you think that the FDA needs to have increased authority? Well, in the last three months alone, two FDA regulated products have become viewed in an entirely different light as a result of data obtained by the FDA as a result of product liability litigation. I'm referring to Halcyon, the sleeping pill, and the silicone gel breast implants. Mm -hmm. Implicit in that is the idea that the FDA didn't have these documents or the, these data until and unless they were able to modify a protective order, a gag order, that the court had imposed on the documents. It does not make sense for the FDA not to have subpoena power in the area of drugs as it partially has now in the area of medical devices. The FDA is hampered in its ability to decide on whether to approve a drug or whether to leave it on the market or whether to uh, put a warning label when it doesn't have the full kinds of studies. So that one remedy, and it's currently been considered in a package of FDA enforcement proposals, which the drug industry, by the way, strongly opposed, was to grant FDA subpoena power for prescription drugs. FDA staff has spent thousands, if not tens of thousands of hours in the last three months going over documents that they should have seen 10 or 20 years ago if things had been working right. So I think that full access to all information concerning safety and efficacy of drugs early on rather than later after the fact is a, a, an essential ingredient of this. Um, and on the issue of developing reciprocal standards and agreements with, with foreign nations, what's your sense of how we might be able to get foreign nations, or if we can, get them to raise their standards to meet our own standards, um, given what your testimony has said is rather than lowering ours is to raising them. Um, what, what, what would be the nature of that process? How would we go about doing that? Well, it's an interesting question, Congresswoman Delorio. I think it's already begun. Uh, within the EEC, there are countries with much better regulatory processes uh, such as the United Kingdom and Sweden and so forth and ones with much worse regulatory processes and there's at least optimism there that 
instead of going to the lowest common denominator, there will be a moving up when standards are arrived at to the higher countries. Uh, once that happens, it will be easier for a, an agreement to be worked out where all of the EEC will move closer to the United States. But I think there are two parts to it. One is what kind of studies are done and how they're done. And independent of that is whether you require rigorous proof of substantial evidence of effectiveness with well-controlled studies, which the United States and a couple other countries do require and other countries do not. So I think you can do the tests in the right way and still retain different standards for approval. The part that is discussed in the Council on Competitiveness proposals that is legal, as opposed to using another country's standards, which we believe is illegal, uh, has to do with saying if we're going to study animals for carcinogenicity or birth defects, this is the way uh, we should do it. I'm all in favor of that. I think the process has already begun. The people from the FDA who went over to the EC and discussed this with other countries came back fairly optimistically, Dr. Temple and Dr. Peck, that we're moving in the right direction in that, on those issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, final question is, what what are the areas, and I know you, you mentioned one, in terms of the, uh, the Council's recommendations uh, that you think are useful in terms of proceeding in a more streamlined um, FDA approval process? I know these are the three that you have particular difficulty with. Just uh, overall, where, is, uh, wh where do you find agreement? Well, again, when these proposals were put forth, there was a lot of emphasis on the issue of drugs for AIDS, drugs for cancer, and other life-threatening circumstances. And the kinds of things that are put forth in those proposals on those issues are good suggestions, but they're already being done. I, I believe there was a significant amount of grandstanding done when these proposals were announced to the extent that FDA was perfectly aware of the need to do a number of these things and has been doing them. We were, of course, the first country in the world, not the last, to approve AZT. And a number of other drugs that were important, unique drugs for illnesses for which there wasn't any other treatment. So other proposals aside from the harmonization of the nature of testing of drugs for safety and effectiveness are ones which I agree with but which the FDA is already doing. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Loro. Uh, Mr. Payne. Thank you. Um, it's getting worse. Let me just try to get a quick question out. She has indicated I have laryngitis here. Uh, I've been disturbed at the lack of clinical trials that are available for women. Uh, we find that it seems that medicine also is not uh, necessarily an equal opportunity business. Uh, we find that women uh, are left out of clinical trials uh, when they were testing aspirin for the prevention of, of heart trouble. Uh, 22,000 persons were used, all men, although the incidence of heart problems actually is higher in women than men. Uh, do you have any feelings or have you, your organization looked into the discrimination of women as it relates to clinical tests and, and just research in general? Uh, there's little question that in a number of areas where men have been properly and adequately tested to find out whether a drug is safe or effective, women have not. It gets even worse when you're talking about older people, uh, a significant majority of whom are women. Uh, so that women are doubly victimized in the sense that there are a number of clinical trials on drugs that are predictably going to be used on people over the age of 70, for example, more of whom are women than men. So women are, in a double way, becoming victimized by not being adequately represented in clinical trials. And I'd have to add that a third group, beyond women and older people, are children. There are a number of drugs that we know are going to get used in young children which are not adequately tested in young children. I think FDA has moved significantly uh, in the last few years to try and redress this problem in all three of these areas, but there's more room to go. So I have another question, a little bit off the basic topic, but we've noticed that there's an increase in tuberculosis in urban areas. We have a tremendous problem that's growing up in urban cities in New York and Newark and places like that. 
and they have a new strain which is resistant of the old uh, bi antibiotics. But the second part of the problem is that um, there seems to be a shortage of the basic medication used to treat tuberculosis, I think it's streptomycin, which is not produced in the United States of America anymore and there, from what I understand, a lack of adequate supply of the medication. Now in order for this to then be manufactured in the United States again or to be accepted, it would probably one have to be manufactured here and since there are no U.S. manufacturers. Uh, are you aware of this potential problem coming up and do you have any suggestions as a solution to it? There's a history in this country of government, state or federal farming out, contracting out to private companies uh, to produce vaccines or antibiotics uh, and I see no reason why uh, the federal government could not take the responsibility for producing this and contract out to some company uh, the production of it. Uh, there is nothing wrong with it. This, this is not to be confused with nationalizing the drug industry or anything. It's meeting a need that there isn't, in the view of the drug industry, a commercially viable uh, reason to meet on their own. I think that there are ways of working that out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Bank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, have a couple of questions. <clears throat> the uh, recommendations made by the Council on Competitiveness are described in your testimony and other documents we have before the committee as proposals. Have these proposals reached a stage of implementation by the administration, and if so, how? In a letter that we sent to the FDA on February 14th, we asked some of these questions about whether or not any of them have been implemented. One of the reasons for our concern was that on the one having to do, reform number three, the one having to do with removing FDA's role in protecting human subjects, uh, the fact sheet handed out by the Council on Competitiveness said, quote, FDA will immediately permit sponsors of new drugs, unquote to submit applications to IRBs rather than the FDA. And this was explicit, not implicit, and was interpreted by at least one company, Eli Lilly, to mean that they could just sort of go ahead. Fortunately, the FDA became aware of it, uh, thanks in part to Congressman Weiss and his staff's efforts, and that was stopped. But we are very concerned, particularly because this one it states will immediately. The second one, having to do with the farming out of the uh, new drug application review, has been done in some way or other, according to FDA, on a partial basis. We don't know the answers to those questions, and we, as of today, have not received any answer in the last month plus from FDA uh, to the inquiry we made on February 14th. Uh, there is a memo that is circulated in the FDA suggesting that there will be a Federal Register notice to solicit comments, amongst others, from FDA employees, physicians, on the issue of the Institutional Review Board. So I don't know whether that can be taken to mean that FDA has not yet gone forward with allowing uh, the IRBs to make the decision themselves. I just don't know the answers to those questions, and we eagerly await the response to our February 14th letter. Are you uh, familiar with any uh, documents, internal documents, or have you seen any in internal documents prepared by the FDA staff uh, which suggest that the FDA has begun implementing the um, uh, plan to farm out non-governmental entities to review certain drug applications? The only th we've not seen any internal documents. We take as a matter of fact the estimate that between 8 and 12 such new drug applications will be farmed out. I don't know whether they have yet began, begun looking for uh, places to farm them out. We have the view that in order to do that, at least in the more extreme way that Congressman Weiss described, would be illegal and at the very least they'd have to go through rulemaking. But I am not aware, I have not been privy to any internal FDA documents other than this one memo describing their intention to go through some form of seeking comments on the Institutional Review Board uh, proposal. As an expert in this area, is it your view that 
in order for the FDA to farm out the review of these new applications, they are required to go through a uh, new regulatory um, process in which they publish such intentions in the Federal Register and, and go, go through the public review and comment uh, requirements. Yeah, we, I mean, in, in the letter that we wrote to the FDA on the 14th, uh, we asked them how they believed under existing regulations uh, this could be done. In other words, we do not believe that that under existing regulations concerning the review of new drug applications, the FDA is uh, able to, to do this as they proposed it. With respect to your first point in your testimony, uh, which was the elimination of the FDA role in uh, the uh, allowing human drug experimentation, uh, should uh, this proposal be implemented by the FDA, would that be in violation of a statute as contrary to a regulation? Well, it, vi it certainly violates a regulation, 21 CFR 312.20a. Uh, we do not know clearly whether it violates the statute. I, you, I think it's, I don't know, just answer that. Uh, the statute, in terms of uh, the IRB issue, uh, the statute says that the, uh, the commissioner, the, uh, the secretary may require the submission of preclinical studies, but there would be the uh, question of if there weren't sufficient controls uh, for conflict of interest, that it would be arbitrary and capricious to, to have the, uh, uh, the, the FDA taken out of the loop because the, uh, the process of sending it only subject to overview by the IRBs wouldn't uh, be sufficient to guarantee the safety and efficacy. So it's, it's not a question you can answer flat out by looking at the statute, but would involve the way it was implemented. In our I don't understand that, because if the new policy is, as you describe, eliminating the FDA's ability to stop human experimentation by withholding approval of a new drug, even if the animal studies show that it's dangerous for human use, how could, under those circumstances, given the law, the FDA be eliminated from continuing uh, surveillance and responsibility for uh, uh, continued uh, testing in humans? I don't understand how that would be possible. Well, if there, I agree with that, actually. If there's any regulatory system that doesn't give the FDA the authority to step in and stop the process, absolutely, that would be arbitrary and capricious and contrary to, to the statute. I, so if the animal tests should show that there is, uh, because of the, uh, the results of the animal studies, that there could be a danger uh, to humans, uh, then, uh, as I understand it, the law clearly gives FDA continuing responsibility, or am I wrong? I, that's right. So then, uh, if in the process of the preliminary experiments and testing they find that the drugs could, in, in fact, because of their animal studies, be injurious to uh, humans, then how could this Council's recommendation of eliminating the Federal uh, Drug Administration's role have any uh, validity whatsoever? I think the, the, the regulations must either have some, some process for the FDA to review all the studies or for keeping the FDA informed on some basis so that if there is anything in the preclinical studies or in the phase one studies that, that raise a red flag, the FDA uh, must be able to step, stop in, step in immediately. One of those has to be uh, provided for. Thank you. Um, I know that we've just been joined by uh, Mr. Sanders. We've got him had a chance to sort of acclimate himself to uh, the hearing and we'll, on the second round, I'll ask you for your opening comments. Uh, I have really only one follow-up question. Uh, you were asked about as to why you raised the uh, uh, campaign contribution issue. Uh, and I had occasion to read the uh, report that um, upon which Appendix 1 is based. And so uh, I'm going to ask you a question about that. But let me preface it by saying that a number of things have distressed me about this, the, the operations of the, uh, of the council, uh, the Quail Council on competitiveness. Um, 
basic one, I guess, fundamental problem is that uh, Congress was very clear in uh, creating certain mandates and, and, and placing them on the FDA. And along comes the Vice President's Council on Competitiveness and it usurps the role that Congress had carved out for FDA. Uh, worse, uh, the FDA is required to maintain scrupulous records as to who has contact with, with it, with its investigators, with its researchers. Uh, the Council doesn't have that. Uh, and so, for example, the first we find out that in fact industry representatives uh, were involved in uh, making recommendations to the council was after under subpoena we received the documents from the FDA of the documentation of the between between the FDA and the council on competitiveness and so that secretiveness is is a is a problem because you you don't know uh, whether in fact uh, uh, the, the regulators are sleeping with the enemy. Uh, if you, if you uh, given the information about it. And I was impressed when I read the report on which the Appendix 1 is based by the report you made as to how the, uh, the council notified uh, companies as to how they could participate in the process and how they then followed that up uh, at, uh, in various locations. I wonder if you could just address that very briefly. Well, before addressing it briefly, I'd like to point out that whereas drug companies were notified that the process was going on, invited to participate, invited to put in their suggestions, we were never invited. So this was hardly a symmetrical process. It was clearly a one-sided process, I believe a subversion of the way in which the laws and regulations governing the FDA are, are supposed to work. Uh, it, it is not, as I said, unlike what happened 20 years ago when each of the federal agencies was asked to, what will you do for big business? This is essentially the Compet Council on Competitiveness Council seeking from big business what it can do for it, completely flying in the face of recommendations by the administrative agency's own Blue Ribbon Commission. It wasn't as though this was an issue that had never been revisited. It had been revisited, as Congressman Thomas points out, by the Lasagna Commission. That was not felt to be adequate or satisfactory by the FDA or HHS. They set up a Blue Ribbon Commission, which had input from industry, consumer groups, patient groups, physicians, researchers, all the groups that should participate. Those recommendations rejected the ones that the Council on Competitiveness at the behest of the industry uh, made. So it, it, is, it is a sort of whispering in closets behind closed doors kind of process that demeans the whole concept of responsible government regulation. Thank you very much. Mr. Thomas? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Whip, all of our here. May I uh, first, uh, I have a couple of other letters I'd like to introduce. So to sort of, uh, this one is a uh, letter to Steve McMillan from Dan Perry, Executive Director of the Alliance of Aging Research. And his letter explains he and his group were invited into discussions by Constance Horner, the chair of the council. He stated three other individuals representing nonprofit health research groups were present. If I may put that in, please. Without objection. Also, a letter from. Uh, Rob Schwartz, Administrative Director for the Public Affairs of the Yale New Haven Medical Center, to Dr. Kessler, in which he expresses support for the proposals of the Competitive Council. Uh, Doctor, um, I, you know, some, sometimes this process is a little confusing as to whether your principal concern is with regard to the recommendations uh, first of all, the recommendations of the council don't have any weight, do they? Uh, well, when, when one of the recommendations says immediately the IRBs will replace the FDA, that seems to have a little bit of weight. But the to council me. doesn't do it. It's FDA that makes the regulations, is it not? Well, it's not clear. As I said, we have not yet received a response to our February 14th letter as to whether 
there is a plan to go through rulemaking is there with any, the first two recommendations. Are there any rules that the Council on Competitiveness has ever put into place? No, but there that, is a certain amount of discretion on the part of administrative agencies as to whether or not they need to go through rulemaking to implement certain recommendations. You're surely aware of the fact that certain policies that the FDA has adopted do not get preceded by a rulemaking process. And we are concerned that some of these may yeah. fall into that category. I, I understand. And, and, and I fully understand if you don't agree with some of these things, lots of people will not agree, I, I presume. But the point is, I guess I'm trying to make and get clear in my own mind, is that there are no regulations uh, recommended or implemented or published by the Council. No, but they've made policy recommendations which could, in our worst fears, be implemented without rulemaking. But the that's rulemaking, what we wrote to the FDA the about. The FDA is required under law to go through rulemaking. Not on not? every decision it makes. That's not correct. I see. But uh, are you objecting to some that they have done and haven't done that way? In the past? Yes. Well, I mean, we have been engaged in a substantial amount of litigation against the FDA because for failing they didn't to go through rulemaking in I various see. instances. But yeah. We don't know what, what they have done here. Well, you know, I, it, it is a puzzlement. And we went through this a little last fall as to whether, uh, uh, frankly, whether the Competitive Council has any particular impact on FDA or whether they don't. Anyone else could recommend to FDA certain things. They still are the ones that are ultimately are responsible. I, I guess that's my point. But they managed, agree with that? They, they managed to get Dr. Kessler to go along with their recommendations. and when. The FDA commissioner appears at a press conference with Vice President Quayle at which these recommendations are announced. It goes beyond just some outside group, be it the White House. Uh, well, Dr. Saying, Kessler is part of the administration, isn't he? Does that surprise you? Do you expect someone who's appointed by the president to take off in a totally different direction? I would hope so if their conscience so dictated. I, and you don't think his would? I don't know the answer to that. That's that, part well, that's of the reason what, for having this hearing today. That's right. And it ought to be a hearing that brings everything out and not simply your objection to these ideas. And I understand that. I'm not the that. only witness at the hearing. You're the only one I see on the list. Well, Dr. Kessler is also a witness. That's exactly right. But you're the only one objecting. Well, that's fine. I don't fine. think that we are the only group in here. the country objecting to these proposals. I think that's Probably a misrepresentation not. Probably of the facts. Not. You're obviously not very uh, enthusiastic with the pharmaceutical industry. How would you change that? Would you, do you think they make too much money? Would you, uh, how would you change the role of the pharmaceutical group? In probably several hundred instances where we have raised questions about the drug industry's practices, uh, we have not infrequently pointed out that there are some wonderful things the drug industry does. No one could or should deny that. It is tragic that along with researching and producing good, useful, effective drugs that they engage in criminal behavior. I mean, one of the main things I would like to see stopped are criminal activities admitted by various large drug companies in which they withhold data from the FDA resulting in hundreds of deaths and thousands of injuries. I think that has got to stop. It will stop sooner rather than later when the first drug industry official is put in jail. And if it's against the law, why, why aren't they? Well, because up until recently there's been very inadequate prosecution by the Justice Department, which the FDA depends on to prosecute these cases. And even in the ones that I mentioned where the three companies pleaded guilty, the fines were $40,000, $50,000, and the most recent, the Herx, about $200,000, no jail sentence. There is inadequate enforcement of the law, and I think that responsible companies aren't going to be as responsible as we would like them to be when they see the government winking at violations that cause large numbers of deaths. Hmm. I couldn't agree with you more. If that's the case, we ought to pursue that. Uh, I agree. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Sanders, uh, if you'd care to make an opening comment or if you have any questions of Dr. Wolf, please. Not at this time. Okay. Uh, Ms. Meng? Oh. Dr. Wolf? Oh. oh. Ms. Zella? Thank you. Uh, opening comment or questions? Right. Thank you very much. Dr. Wolf and Mr. Payne has returned. You have no further questions. Uh, thank you very much for your participation, Mr. Wolfson. We really appreciate it. Our next witness will be the commissioner, 
of FDA, uh, Dr. Kessler, and other witnesses from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and before we proceed, Dr. Kessler, would you introduce your colleagues to the subcommittee who are with you? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me introduce my colleagues. Um, sitting down at the table right now to my far right uh, is Mr. Bill Hubbard, the Associate Commissioner for Policy Coordination. Uh, right next to me is Dr. Bruce Burlington who is Deputy Director for Medical Affairs at the Center for uh, Drug Evaluation and Research. Uh, and to my immediate left is uh, Ms. Margaret Jane Porter, uh, who's Chief Counsel for the, uh, for the agency. Thank you very much. Uh, as I explained earlier, it is the custom of our committee to swear in all witnesses. So would you all please raise, rise and raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes, sir. Thank you. Let the record indicate that each of the witnesses has responded in the affirmative. Dr. Kessler, I want to thank you for being with us today. I know that you have a very difficult and complicated uh, schedule. Um, once I ask you to give your testimony, let me remind you that you have 10 minutes uh, in which you, we hope we'll summarize your remarks because we do have many questions and I'm sure that all the, uh, you have all the opportunity to present a full case in the course of your testimony. Uh, before we go, because it is the, before we go into the testimony, uh, it, it is the news of the day. Uh, let me ask you, I've I seen the reports, I have not seen the press conference, but I've seen the reports in the morning papers and, and uh, about uh, uh, Dow Corning uh, making a decision to remove itself from the uh, silicone uh, gel breast implant manufacturing uh, aspect of their business. And uh, in there's, there's some mention in, in the, the releases and the reports that uh, they will be funding some kind of research program um, and also will be providing some funding for uh, women who have implants who want to have them removed for the cost of the, of the, the removal was some part of it. And as, as you know, one of our concerns, my concerns and the subcommittee's concerns is that the hundreds of thousands, perhaps into the million or more, women who have had these implants over these past 30 years not now be abandoned by industry without any further effort to determine what hazards they may be facing in the future. And uh, I would hope that in fact the quote research program that, that uh, Dow Corning has announced will uh, include a uh, study of women who have had these implants over the years, the various kinds of implants that they've had, uh, so that in fact there would be some basis for uh, providing information to, to the women who have not yet, uh, thankfully, had had problems, but would, are, I'm sure are very agonized as to what may be facing them in the future. And I wonder if there's anything you can tell us to enlighten us about that. M Mr. Chairman, uh, our We've committed to making a decision uh, about future availability of these devices by April 20th. I share your concern about making sure that the women who already have these implants have all the information uh, available. Uh, it's been 30 years since these devices uh, have gone into use. Uh, and the real problem here the real tragedy is 30 years of use and we still don't have a lot of the answers. Let me commit to you, Mr. Chairman, that we will do everything in our power to make sure that we get answers for those women who already have these devices implanted, regardless 
of the decision about future availability. That is my primary concern about making sure that those women who already have these devices know everything about them. To that end, uh, Dr. Mason, the Assistant Secretary for Health, and I have talked, um, and there is a public health service task force that has been set up um, that is being uh, co-chaired, uh, one by Dr. Jane Haney uh, from our agency, who's Deputy Commissioner for Operations. Uh, Dr. Haney just joined the agency several months ago, but she comes to the agency having previously been Deputy Director of the National Cancer Institute. She's the Chief Operating Officer of the agency. Uh, she, with Dr. Richard Atkinson um, of the National Cancer Institute, will co-chair a PHS task force specifically on the question you raised, on the research question, to make sure that once and for all we get the information about the risks and benefits of these silicone gel-filled breast implants. I thank you very much uh, uh, for that and uh, that it's reassuring and of course we will be following closely uh, the work of your task force. Um, uh, at, at this point then we're prepared to receive your testimony on today's subject and we will uh, try really to limit to the extent that we can to this uh, to focus on on the subject at hand. Dr. Kessler. Uh, thank you Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the role of the Food and Drug Administration in the drug development and review process. Since joining the agency, I have repeatedly emphasized how strongly I feel about accelerating the review of therapies for life-threatening diseases to get new medicines to desperately ill patients as soon as possible. No tremendous insight is required, Mr. Chairman, when one works in an emergency room in the Bronx, as I have done, to see what is going on, to understand on the most basic level what is needed. AIDS is epidemic in the city both you and I call home. Alzheimer's disease, the most common cause of senile dementia, currently affects four million Americans. There are no drugs on the market to treat this devastating disease. Chronic diseases such as cystic fibrosis continue to exact their toll and there seems to be growing public anxiety and appropriate awareness concerning such life-threatening diseases as cancer, especially breast cancer. The key question, Mr. Chairman, is how do we get promising new therapies to patients as quickly as possibly and as safely as possible? Fortunately, when I arrived at the Food and Drug Administration about 17 months ago, I found an agency already willing to experiment to be flexible. In response to the AIDS epidemic, the under, unyielding toll of such diseases as cancer and an apparent shift in public attitudes, the FDA had reassessed its approach to drug development and review. In 1987, the treatment IND procedure permitted wider access to promising experimental drugs while their controlled clinical trials were still underway. In 1988, the so-called subpart E procedure emphasized the FDA's desire to advance drug development by working with sponsors on the design of early trials and the development of strong phase two studies to support approval. Patients with terminal illnesses should have a greater voice in what risks they want to accept from a drug still under development. Mr. Chairman, FDA will go the extra mile to develop and review new therapies for life-threatening diseases, and I intend to continue pushing the drug development envelope, and I am committed to expanding it even further. The FDA is about to add a new phrase to the lexicon of drug development, accelerated approval. Let me tell you a little about how this approach has already worked in one instance, DDI. I sat, sat next to Dr. Carl Peck, director of FDA Center for Drugs, during two long days last year when our advisory committee met to weigh the evidence on DDI. I told the advisory committee that our goal for AIDS drugs was to review study designs in weeks and to measure review times in months. What the committee did, what the FDA did, established some important new precedents. What we did with DDI, what made it different, is that we were willing to take some real risks. This is not something that government agencies usually feel comfortable doing. 
More than ever before, in the case of DDI, we were part of the drug development process. We called the company in far earlier than usual. We told them we wanted to see the data even before the company submitted its dr drug application. We recognized that we would have to review at least one study still underway. In short, we asked ourselves, how do we make the case scientifically that the drug works if, in fact, it does work? Ultimately, DDI was approved with the condition that FDA would take appropriate action if the final results of the clinical trials proved unsatisfactory. The ability to do this was crucial. FDA's deep involvement in the drug development process poses certain risks. There's a risk of a loss of objectivity. That's why we, we presented our results of our analysis to the advisory committee. We could have said, wait six more months, wait another year until more data are in. But in making DDI available, we showed a willingness to make the best possible decision based on the information available at the time. Mr. Chairman, we acted. It is in this context, and only in this context, that the initiatives of the President's Council on Competitiveness must be viewed. The FDA welcomes these initiatives. We have worked closely with the Competitiveness Council in developing them. Many of them, most of them, originated in the FDA. We are hard at work at implementing them because they complement the many innovations already planned or underway. Mr. Chairman, the activism that has come out of the AIDS community will not be confined simply to AIDS. We're starting to hear from the breast cancer community, from the cystic fibrosis community, from the Alzheimer's community. We're hearing the message and we're hearing it loud and clear that business as usual is simply not good enough. There are those who argue that in product review, the status quo must reign. Innovation is unwelcome because it may involve risks. This risk-averse point of view will not thrive in the FDA of today. In fact, when it comes to drugs for life-threatening diseases, the riskiest thing we can do is to be unwilling to take risks. The FDA will continue to move forward. We will aggressively move forward to streamline the review process, to take an active role in drug development, to become more efficient. But one thing we will not do is lower our standards. Our job is not to lower our standards. Our job is to look for creative ways to solve problems, creative approaches to looking at data, fresh ideas for streamlining the process from whatever the source. One of the reasons why the U.S. pharmaceutical industry has been so successful is, I believe, in part because of high standards. In the end, the emphasis on drugs that really work is what is going to sustain the pharmaceutical, the U.S. pharmaceutical industry as the most competitive in the world. Mr. Chairman, the recommendations of the President's Council on Competitiveness are about streamlining the process. They are about getting safe and effective new products to desperately ill patients in time to save lives. The, council interest, the Council's interest presents a welcome opportunity. The emphasis of the Council on Drug Development provides necessary visibility and an added impetus for the reforms already underway. Mr. Chairman, I ask that my formal testimony be admitted for the record at this time. Without objection, we, that would be We would be, be happy to answer any questions you or your colleagues uh, have for us. Yes, we will again operate under the five-minute rule. Thank you, Dr. Kessler. Since 1990, the Quail Council has been overseeing the federal regulatory process, including FDA's activities under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Under what statutory authority does the Council operate? Mr. Chairman, I am here and I am perfectly willing to answer any questions that relate to FDA and FDA's involvement and that's my charge. That's what I was sworn to do. That's my oath of office. I am not here. I am just not competent to talk about the workings of the Competitiveness Council uh, nor their statutory authority. I am perfectly happy to talk about anything um, that uh, is FDA, within FDA's province. Well, except that you were a part of the working group, uh, is that right, of the, of the Vice President's I, I, Council? I was invited to, to meetings. I participated fully. I was a member of the working group. About two weeks after I assumed 
in early December of 1990, the first meeting, I was uh, uh, sworn in, you know, November the previous uh, month. Uh, I was invited to meetings. I participated in uh, those meetings. Uh, but again, I didn't run those meetings, uh, and I'm not responsible for those meetings. I'm responsible for the FDA. Uh, is there, uh, who's, who's your counsel with you? Is there? Uh, Ms. Porter. Ms. Porter? Do you, can you answer that question as to uh, what statutory authority the council operates under? What I can say, Mr. Chairman, is that it's my understanding that the Competitiveness Council has been charged by the President and the Vice President with certain policy review and development functions, uh, particularly as those relate to coordinating policy development among several agencies. Uh, in, in that vein, my understanding is the Competitiveness Council has established, I think, six working groups, including... Well, I, it, it, I think that, again, your answer is, is generally correct. The, Council's regulatory review powers were created not by statute, but by two executive orders signed by President Reagan. Uh, who else besides yourself, Dr. Kessler, served on the Council's working group on the drug approval process? Dr. Bromley, uh, the, the official members, um, were uh, Alan Bromley, who was Office of Science and Technology Policy, the director. He was represented during most of the meetings, I believe, uh, by Dr. D.A. Henderson, who's formerly Dean of the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins. Uh, Michael Darby, um, uh, the, the, um, Tom Scully, Jim McRae, uh, Boyd and Gray, Richard Porter, uh, Bill Raub, uh, who's, who was then acting director of the uh, NIH um, and one of the members of the uh, Council of Economic Advisors is uh, Richard, uh, uh, how do you pronounce, I, I never pronounced it right, uh, Richard Porter and uh, uh, Richard uh, Schmalenes. Right, and I understand that Constance Horner, Deputy yes. Secretary of HHS, uh, that's the correct. Chair of the uh, uh, Ms. Horner was the uh, uh, Deputy Secretary of HHS, and she was chair, uh, right. chairwoman of the working group. Now, you, the, your working group met through throughout 1991, and two of your meetings were with industry groups representing drug and biotechnology companies. At those meetings, the trade associations made recommendations regarding the kinds of changes they would like to see in FDA's drug approval processes. Isn't that correct? I remember uh, some of the recommendations that were made, yes. The Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, or PMA, met with the Council on April 12, 1991, and specifically recommended, one, drug companies should have the option of selecting outside reviewers for initial human drug trials. Two, drug companies should have the option of selecting outside reviewers for their new drug application. And three, surrogate endpoints, apparently for any disease, should be used as alternative indicators of effectiveness when they are reasonable predictors of effectiveness. Now, these three positions bear a very strong resemblance to the Quail Council's IRB external review and accelerated approval proposals that were announced last November. Isn't that correct? Mr. Chairman, I don't, uh, I can look it up, I can look up the, uh, we had, have a document with PMA's uh, recommendations. Um, the, the, the recommendations you cited, the, the thing that, uh, uh, the bell that goes off in my head, uh, were very similar to the lasagna committee report. Uh, well, they may be, but what I'm asking you is, isn't it a fact that the pharmaceutical it, manufacturers it, it certainly is possible. I, I would have recommendations? I, I, I would have, the, the management, most of the PMA's recommendations, and if I can maybe get the report and take a quick look at it, uh, most of the, the PMA recommendations had to do with management reforms, management, uh, management initiatives. I don't re Well, you're, yeah. not, you're not questioning that, in fact, these, will you dig out the memo, or will somebody show him the memo of April 12th? Well, well let, me, let me read you some of the... No, no, just, I'm, uh, I'm asking you specifically whether those three recommendations were made by the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association to the working group in that memo of April 12, 1991. I, I have the, the, the um, what the uh, PMA submitted. Um, we'll, we'll show you a copy of it right now. Okay. 
again, they, they, they tended to be more management uh, systems, adopt the management system that incorporates decision-making authority as well as accountability in the review process. Approval authority should be delegated to lower levels in CEDAR. Yeah, we, would you look at that memo, that specific part of it? We're reading from, we're reading from, the, uh, uh, from the same kind of chart. Uh, Right, and I'm asking you whether drug sponsors should be able to choose among the FDA of, as a reviewer of INDs. Yes, right, I mean, Mr. Chairman. Let me just put that in context. You should. Well, know, I'm really asking you a yes or no. Whether in fact uh, those were recommendations made to the working group by the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. Th they were, and they also were part of recommendations made by an endless number of commissions who've studied the FDA over the years. Thank you. Okay, my time has has expired for. Uh, now, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, I was going to ask you about uh, how you perceived the problems, but apparently what we're more about here is the process. Uh, I presume that uh, the President and the Vice President can bring together groups to review policy under most any circumstances, and that's what I understand this commission is about. Absolutely. The, uh, uh, we sat, uh, uh, we had, uh, I represented the agency and uh, an administration doesn't, uh, no one person in an administration uh, makes uh, policy with the exception of the president. Uh, when we all sit and uh, uh, we try to develop a consensus throughout the levels of government, uh, whether it's the agency or the department uh, or OMB or the White House, and that's what uh, was attempted here. The um, regulations then that finally come out governing FDA come from FDA, do they not? They do not come from the Competitive Council? Any reg anything requiring uh, regulations, I have to sign. Uh, I have to put my signature and they have to, uh, certain, in certain things, uh, the buck stops here. Other things uh, are within other pre person's uh, uh, province, but when it comes to regulations specifically, uh, certain regulations um, I have the signature authority on, others uh, uh, the secretary has the signature on, and some we have both. So it's uh, uh, the it is FDA's uh, responsibility. The gentleman who testified from Public Citizen had some doubts as to your willingness to make your own regulations uh, with regard to the recommendation, that the recommendations from this council would probably override your own judgment. How do you react to that? Uh, in the 17 months that I've been uh, uh, commissioner, no one, uh, I've not signed one regulation uh, that I didn't uh, believe 100 percent in. I wouldn't do that. Um, it's, it's my responsibility, that's what I'm sworn to do, and that's what I commit to you that I will continue to do. You had a job before you came here. I can <laughs> go, I uh, took care of kids uh, uh, in the Bronx. I, I can always go take care of, I had a couple, as you know. I was also teaching in your district. Mr. Very Chairman. briefly, uh, well, first of all, Mr. Chairman, I would like to put into the record uh, a couple of things, an op-ed piece to the New York Times by Martin Delaney, who is executive director of uh, Operation Inform, an AIDS activist. I have uh, a letter from Mr. Delaney to Dr. Kessler uh, and also uh, one to Henry Waxman. Both of these are in support of the general uh, recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Laura? Uh, uh, have uh, I used my time? No, no, no. I think I, I'm just almost through. I, I, there were three. There were three things, again, in the previous testimony that were singled out. One uh, was the elimination of the FDA's role in decisions to allow human drug experimentation after animal studies are complete, completed. Uh, there was objection to that. Would you, would you react to, uh, to that? I, I assume you're talking about the, the specific uh, recommendation um, that talks about uh, IRB review in early clinical research. Yes, sir. You know, I, 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 I'm amazed uh, that that all of a sudden has become so controversial. Um, if you go back, oh, I think it was 1980, uh, you look at the McMahon Commission. Uh, the McMahon Commission uh, was established by Congressman Scheuer. It was, uh, it was uh, Energy and Commerce, I believe, set up a commission 
to study it. Uh, it was a bipartisan commission. Uh, it had representatives, uh, broad representatives. It had uh, members of the, uh, the public interest community. It had representatives from public citizen. It had representatives from the academic community. It had representatives from industry. And essentially the same recommendation that came out of the Competitiveness Council was recommended uh, then. It wasn't very controversial then. The agency proposed it. There was a, the, the basic issue is uh, how do you stimulate research? How do we make sure there are not unnecessary impediments, but there are appropriate safeguards for early clinical research? I served uh, in my previous life on, I, on two IRBs, uh, one at the medical school and, and, and one at the hospital. Um, it's not a new idea. Can we ha take early uh, research um, and can we delegate uh, some of the responsibility to the IRBs in certain instances? Uh, I think the answer is yes. I think uh, there has to be specific criteria. It may not be appropriate in all instances. It may not be appropriate for all drugs. Uh, but I think in many doctors' minds, in many investigators' minds, uh, FDA, dealing with the FDA is, uh, can be relatively burdensome and uh, stand in the way of some research that perhaps can be undertaken uh, safely. With, uh, we can streamline the process a little more is what it comes down to. Thank you very much. Can, can I just, re you, you, you mentioned the Martin Delaney uh, point, and I'd just like to, if I may, take a comment. Uh, because I think that's awfully important. Uh, what you see, it's been a rough number of years. We've learned a lot from the AIDS community. AIDS has taught us a lot uh, as an agency. Um, and I think as an agency, we worked very hard, and I think we're very proud of the fact that, you know, one of the recommendations in the President's, in the uh, uh, Competitiveness Council for accelerated approval, I think we've, I think, there may be some disagreement on some of the proposals, but that one proposal about accelerated review, what we previously call conditional uh, review, I mean, it, I think, you know, we brought together uh, people from the AIDS community, from the agency, from other portions of government, from industry, to work together. I mean, we ha I, mean I think there's, there's a shift in the way we're, we're doing business. And, and what started off is a lot of, you know, uh, uh, yelling and screaming and uh, uh, parading and charges here and there. I think we're pulling together to work on some very difficult problems. Good. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Ms. Doro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony, Dr. Kessler. Um, let me just, uh, in, in your original written testimony, you discussed the use of expanded um, the expanded use of advisory panels as a means in which to help to expedite the, um, the review process. Um, I think you're aware that there has been uh, criticism of that uh, kind of an approach. Uh, and I'll just quote to you, on February 18th, the, the Wall Street Journal published a, uh, an editorial uh, stating the following. Very simply, the Food and Drug Administration is dysfunctional. In place of clean decisions, it substitutes regulatory delay, a bureaucratic device to evade responsibility for anything. Instead, it shifts responsibility and public attention onto advisory committees whose members it handpicks. Can you please just respond to the criticism and describe what efforts that the FDA takes to ensure uh, that the advisory panels are fair and impartial? The, perhaps one of the, the, the greatest inventions of the agency has been, in my opinion, the use of advisory committees. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw certainly the most public use of an advisory committee uh, just uh, very recently on, on breast implants. Um, I think that we don't have all the expertise um, available. Uh, within the agency. We don't have all the judgment. Sometimes we're close. T take DDI in, 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 my, in, my, in my statement. Uh, we really stepped into the, for one of the, you know, one of the first times in the agency's history, we became the proponent of the drug. We wanted to make the case, if a case was there, that the drug actually, uh, if it worked, you know, we were trying to make the case. We weren't sitting there waiting for the industry to make the case. We worked with our colleagues at the NIH. There was only phase one trials. There were only historical controls. We reached for the data. 
we became, in some ways, the advocate for the drug. Now, that has certain risks. We can lose our objectivity. We could, I mean, th there's a fine line that we have to walk. Now, one of the safeguards that we had was that we took the best scientists we could, uh, the, 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 the leaders in age research, the clinicians in age research, and we brought them together. Um, and we presented the data. And they, they, they assure an appropriate check and balance. Are there downsides to advisory committees? Sure. Um, they can delay the process. They can be another layer if it's not managed well. One of the things we, we've undertaken is we have the Institute of Medicine looking at the whole question of how we use advisory committees. Um, that, what, will there be a report yes, forthcoming from there? there? When is that report? Uh, I, I, w I think it's about a year. Um, uh, the, 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 that the Institute of Medicine is or, com committee is already underway to look at our operating procedures. It, 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 we're living in a world where one of the issues that we have to manage with regard to advisory committees, it's very complicated, is the whole issue of conflict of interest. Um, if you have the experts and you want the real experts, chances are if there's only five experts in this country on a certain issue, you know, they, they may have certain conflicts. And how do we manage those conflicts? You can get people who don't have conflicts, but if you want someone who knows something about it, they may have a conflict. And how do we manage that? And that's one of the important questions we've asked the Institute of Medicine. We look for the best possible experts, but we have to minimize conflicts. We look for diversity of opinion. We look for diversity of representation. One of the, one of the things that I think one of the important uh, uh, things we've done recently with regard to our antivirals um, committee, uh, we asked uh, uh, representatives of the AIDS community to serve on those advisory committees. When we, on our uh, uh, nervous system uh, committee, we asked representatives of Alzheimer's disease uh, uh, the, uh, to serve on that committee. During breast implants, we asked, uh, you know, ethicists, psychologists, we brought in the kinds of representation so we can get all views. Can we just then, uh, Dr. Kessler, review, get a copy of the charge that you have given to the Institute of Medicine in terms of taking a look at the, the advisory committees and what kinds of things that you're asking them to take a look to at? We would be happy to submit that. Thank you. I have a few questions, and I know I'm not going to make them all in this round, but I'll, uh, I'll come back. Right. I know we'll come back. Uh, I'd like to ask some questions with regarding the photophoresis application, which I think is a clear example of of um, why the process needs to be reformed. And, uh, well, I'm not sure if, mm -hmm. if Dr. Kessler is in a position to really respond in detail to subjects other than well, that which we had. I, uh, I would just say this to you, though, uh, Mr. Chairman, that if there are new procedures, my questions have to do with, uh, given the delays in the photophoresis process, are the recommendations of the Council on Competitiveness um, are they procedures that are, would affect a new application on photophoresis? Are there some ways in which we're looking at a new process here that will um, uh, expedite that kind of, um, of effort? I don't know, and I, I, wanna, I, I don't I'll know take Dr. your guidance Kessler's, on this, Mr. Chairman. You're, if you're, Dr. Uh, Kessler is, wants to respond or if he wants to submit your responses, his responses in writing to you, that would be all right. I, I'm not prepared to talk about any specific application, Congresswoman, today. Uh, obviously, the intent is to have the recommendations apply to any drug of life-saving potential. Well, let me just ask you this, that under the new regulations, as announced by the Vice President's uh, Council, uh, would photophoresis be given an expedited review? Uh, let me let, uh, uh, again, I'm not prepared to really answer that question, but let me let Dr. Burlington, who has a little familiarity. Uh, thank you. We certainly regard scleroderma as a very serious illness. It's a disease that often leads to death in patients and as a consequence would uh, seem to fit squarely within the scope of the uh, draft accelerated approval uh, regulation. So that it would receive an expedited review under the new regulations? The, 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 again, I... I the, yes the, or the, no? Well, it, it, the, the new um, rule applies to life-threatening diseases and the use of surrogate endpoints. Uh, I'm not sure that the surrogate endpoint uh, issue was of relevance uh, I don't know what yeah. surrogate endpoints yeah. are, Dr. Could, could you? Could, could We'd be happy we to can, submit it for the record. We can Would you, because it seems to me that in, 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 in your response that you give to Mr. Rowe, 
would you also incorporate whether in fact it is not the case that if it's, if it's life-threatening that it may in fact already be covered by current policy of the FDA? We, we'd be happy to write. I would just like to add, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we did have a, a uh, an inquiry from the FDA about what we were going to be talking about and specifically with my office I did talk about issues of photophoresis so I didn't do this justice no, no, out no, of no. the blue no I appreciate but that. I have additional questions and I'll come back on the second round on on the on uh, other issues Fine. not specific and, uh, to uh, if you photophoresis. Will submit these questions to we'll him uh, he'll respond to you in writing thank uh, you Mr. Zeller thank you Mr. Chairman uh, Dr. Kessler, how many investigations by Congress and GAO uh, have looked into the processes and practices of the FDA over the last decade? Uh, endless number of uh, investigations. In fact, I think there's an article, one of the former general counsels published an article about 10 years ago, and all the, the whole subject of the article was just listing all the number uh, of investigations and reviews and uh, uh, commissions. Uh, uh, that have looked at the drug review process and other agency processes, an endless number. And uh, you, you served on the Edwards Commission in 1990, which studied the management of FDA. I did. Uh, in their recommendations, they clearly pointed out uh, the deficiencies in FDA practices and, and facilities. The Commission did not make recommendations with an eye towards FDA receiving increased resources because that simply was not going to happen in the budget climate. Uh, did you agree overall with their findings? If I, if I, I was, uh, um, when I was nominated for this position, I was uh, kicked off the Edwards Committee. Uh, I think they did. I, if I remember, there was a comment about resources in, in that, uh, in that uh, report. The general management kinds of reforms about streamlining the process. Uh, one of the uh, recommendations in that Edwards committee, what they call conditional approval is what we're here, one of the recommendations we're talking about today. I certainly agreed with that. Um, what steps do you think that the FDA, in addition to the one you just mentioned, has made to address the concerns raised in the report? Any others? Oh, we have, uh, I think the, it's fair to say, uh, Congressman, that the agency today is not necessarily the agency of 17 months ago. There's a whole new uh, management team. Uh, that has been uh, put in uh, to place. Uh, we are trying to act as decisively as we can and uh, uh, to assure the Congress and the American public that we're up to the task of doing our job. Um, it's been a very uh, uh, strenuous, we've worked very hard over the last 17 months, there's a lot more to do. By, uh, by our count, the FDA has been called before Congress for hearings 344 times between January 1st, 1980 and today. And Chairman Weiss has called the FDA officials before the subcommittee 22 times since 1982. Is it fair to say that you are unusually accused of some kind of wrongdoing in the majority of congressional hearings you are required to attend? I, uh, I welcome congressional oversight, uh, Congressman. <laughs> politics is politics. <laughs> Is it fair to say that the subcommittee and the majority of the hearings it has held has been very critical of FDA activities and proposals? Let's put it this way. The, the, the number of times you come to the Hill and say, they say, good job, um, is, it's, a, it's a rare occurrence. Uh, Do you know of any times in recent past? I, 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 think that, uh, I think there's some support for the agency. I think there is renewed support uh, for the agency. I, I, I think that the, the issue is, uh, when I came to the agency 17 months ago, there wasn't not a lot of confidence that we were up to the task of doing the job. Um, we're, we're trying our best to restore the credibility. We're trying to do our job. Um, I think the Congress recognizes uh, uh, that, and um, we are certainly ready to work with the Congress in any way. Yeah, I, I understand, Congressman. I mean, I, I used to sit behind um, you know, the members. I, I mean, I, I come from this world. Um, I was staff. Um, I welcome uh, the oversight. We have to be accountable. Uh, there are good things that come out of uh, 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 being held accountable. There are also some costs. Um, there is, there's always hype. Things get played out of proportion. 
Um, I don't, you know, th these are, for example, these recommendations today. I mean, I, the, the principles within those recommendations, I believe in. You know, the, it's, we're, we're made, the, the stories are, well, you know, Kessler was forced to do this. Nonsense. These are things that, that, um, that I believe in. Um, the things that I think will work. The things we want to experiment on. So there's always, a, there's always the hype. Uh, associated with, and that's the downside. Uh, but I think in the end, um, I think everyone understands what's at stake, and I think we're all willing to work together. I think earlier, the discussions on the PMA recommendations in April, and then the Competitiveness Council in, in November uh, were brought forth, but weren't these also discussed though, since 1977 and some seven other commissions as well? And, and uh, Aren't these, aren't these recommendations been pretty similar? Yes. Um, is it fair to say that, that the FDA has also been called before many committees and subcommittees as well as in the House but also in the Senate to complain about the drug approval process? We are constantly, we can be criticized either for getting things out too fast or getting things out too slow. It's a balancing act. Uh, neither is our job. We can speed it up, we can be more thorough. What's important is to get safe and effective products out there. Can you comment on micro, congressional micromanagement of the FDA? There are days, Congressman, that, that I pull out my hair. We, we do invest a lot of time in Xeroxing, there is no question. We get about two document requests in a day. Uh, but again, um, I respect the process. I think there are things that, uh, uh, there, is, there are certainly positive things about the process and I welcome the oversight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Zeloff. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kessler, I suspect that uh, you welcomed oversight uh, and, and appreciated it more when you were staff and when you were teaching it than you do currently. Uh, at the same time, I hope that uh, you have not found this chair and this subcommittee to be unsupportive or non-supportive of your efforts? We, we, we uh, absolutely, uh, uh, you know, th there is one thing that the agency has not been very good in the past, and that's telling its story, and telling its side of the story. Well, uh, I don't want to take any, any of the time. I appreciate that. I just want to make that as a comment. Uh, Mr. Payne. Thank you very much. You weren't here earlier. I have to explain to everyone. This isn't my normal voice. I have laryngitis, but the um, just looking at. <clears throat> I missed your testimony, but I assume that you uh, support the um, the Council on Competitiveness and the administration's recommendation to uh, <clears throat> speed up the process. Yes. Okay. Uh, have you begun to implement? this plan and how is it going to go forth? There are a whole host of recommendations um, in that report and each one needs to be uh, dealt with in a somewhat different fashion. Some require uh, for us to go through notice and comment rulemaking. Uh, some are management uh, initiatives that are already that were underway before. Uh, even the report. Uh, others, uh, we need to talk to the affected communities uh, and see what their support is and how best to implement. So each one of the recommendations uh, require, are sort of on a different track. And I can't answer your question, you know, in, in general. Okay. Uh, do you currently use outside experts to conduct clinical reviews? There have been in the past uh, uh, occasionally outside experts to review uh, specific uh, applications uh, brought in as consultants and we certainly use them on advisory committees. Have you found this being uh, an effective process, something that you would like to increase, decrease, restudy? The, the ultimate uh, <coughs> recommendation, I mean, for to uh, try with 8 to 12 applications um, and to submit that to external review. One of the reasons why we, why we at the agency recommended um, that idea to the Competitiveness Council and why the Competitiveness Council accepted that was to answer your exact question. 
we'd like to experiment, we'd like to innovate. Uh, in, we've done it a couple of times, we'd like to see whether it works, we'd like to see whether there's a value. There's no one magic bullet that's going to speed up the drug review process. Um, but I think that uh, uh, it's something that we would like to try. It may work, it may not work, but let's see. Okay, in the uh, press conference that you had on November the 13th of 1991, uh, according to the Star Ledger New Jersey newspaper, said the FDA estimates that the reform would reduce the time needed to approval for the approval for the approval of drugs for life-threatening diseases from 9.75 years to 5.5 years. And with the faster approval, the council said drug companies could save an average of 60 million of the 231 million needed to develop a new drug. And on the other hand, there were some comments that uh, skeptics that warned that the plan would lower safety standards and give too much power to drug industry and become a financial um, a link between uh, potential uh, private reviewers. Now on balance with the 5.5 to 9.75 years and on balance the 60 million saved out of 231 million dollars but then on the other hand with the question of lower standards. How, how will you determine, it's sort of similar to that first question, it's difficult, but I want to know how do, you, how do you get the balance? How do you keep people from saying we're speeding it through to uh, make it more profitable for the drug industry? On the other hand, you have people saying we need to come up with some answers to life-threatening diseases and would this be primarily for life-threatening diseases like AIDS or other uh, uh, problems where people have very little choice. Uh, you know, I grew up uh, reading, I used to be a newspaper boy and I used to read the paper a lot. And I grew up during the time that those foreign drugs for futility came on the market and there were many, many birth defects. And I always remembered that the FDA, the U.S. government, had a policy of making sure that everything was crystal clear, perfect as it can be to give confidence to the consumers in this country. And so I always felt that we should keep high standards, we should be sure that it's absolutely safe and so forth. So I guess to get around to it again, uh, what, how do you keep the balance? How are you going to be able to monitor this thing? I think there are two standards that are developing uh, in this country, uh, Congressman. I think for routine kind of illnesses, headache, routine kinds of symptoms. The American people um, expect almost, you know, it's almost an unrealistic expectation. For those diseases, they want zero risk. Uh, and the outcry, um, if there's any risk uh, that happens. And I, and I don't think they are willing to accept uh, very significant risks for those routine kinds of illnesses. When it comes to life-threatening diseases, when there's no alternatives, when people are dying, I think what we're hearing, I mean, outside of the Beltway, is people are willing to accept some risks if the benefits, the potential benefits, are, uh, are there. No one is talking about, okay, the, the task before us is not to lower our standards. Our task is to streamline the process to get rid of any management inefficiencies, to make sure that we do it um, in as efficient a manner as possible. But in the end, it's the same risk-benefit equation. It hasn't changed. When the benefits are potentially great, the risks you can take, I mean, also can be great. It's that basic risk-benefit equation that you wrote into the law in 1962. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Z uh, Hobson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Kessler, I want to uh, congratulate you for the aggressive new spirit that I find uh, at, your, at the FDA. And I, I also want to make this comment to you. In uh, May of this year, I had prepared a letter that I was going to address to the chairman here to get a hearing because I had written the Alzheimer's bill in Ohio, and THA was uh, a big hot issue with a lot of Alzheimer's groups that wasn't getting approved. I never sent that letter uh, to the chairman to ask for the hearing because under 
your new aggressive management, uh, THA, uh, got approved. And what I find incredible, I think if these approaches that we had done that, that came out were not from the competitive council or there wasn't this tie, I doubt that we would be having this hearing today, but I think there's just a little bit of politics involved. But the, I also wrote... The gentleman suggesting that, that we're, we're, we're holding these hearings for political purposes? I said just a little bit. Um, the other thing, the other, the other thing that concerns me is uh, when I wrote the, all, the uh, AIDS bill in Ohio, which was a comprehensive AIDS bill, uh, the AIDS community was irate with the FDA uh, over lack of approval of, of the various types of aggressive programs that were in other parts of the world. And many people were going outside or trying alternate treatments, which the FDA either wasn't looking at or wouldn't look at, which I thought was a very dangerous procedure. And I guess I have a couple of, uh, of things, and I don't want to take up all the time with my statement, but what I think has tainted the thing is the fact that these things, if they had come straight out of you all, we wouldn't have had the difficulties that many people have with this approach, because there are many people in, in these two particular groups that like the aggressiveness of the department and your aggressiveness. But one of the complaints in looking at health care costs overall is this question that Mr. Payne, I think, was talking about before, this trade-off. Is there any way to look at um, reciprocal approvals, uh, to look at um, harmonization in trade negotiations that we might, without giving up the, the, the perfection that we expect, as the public does from the FDA, find ways to get things to market here faster where you do have this benefit so that not that the drug companies can make money but that we can lessen the health care costs to the public in the use of those types of, of uh, drugs. Congressman, I think you're exactly correct. I think that there are two things. Go abroad go into some countries, you can find 40, 50 drugs, you mentioned Alzheimer's, to treat that devastating disease. And you can go buy, it can be prescribed. Do any of them work? No. Can you imagine what our health care bill would be if we started having, flooding our pharmacies uh, with medicines that didn't work? You know, the standard that we've maintained, I believe, requiring things to work, I think in the end, saves us an inordinate amount of money on the, on the health care, uh, our total health care expenditures. In fact, what I think the, the trend is, what we've done for drugs to make sure things uh, work, I think the whole emphasis uh, is now shifting, taking that, what we, that kind of system and applying it to procedures. Do the procedures that we as physicians use, do they work? But your, your other point is equally important. There is a lot we can do to harmonize. There, there are only limited amount of research facilities. There's only amount of, a limited amount uh, of resources globally. Can, it, can we harmonize the data requirements, the kind of forms, the kind of tests, the size of, of populations? Why should... Um, we all want to get drugs out. Uh, we all want investment in drugs. Why should a drug company have to do one set kind of application for one country and, 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 and write it all up and spend you know, all the resources and a completely different one? Uh, we are working uh, to harmonize. I've spent a lot of time personally with uh, Keith Jones. Uh, in fact, some of the recommendations uh, in this report uh, came after we listened to Manny Summers of Canada because they had tried, they had innovated. The whole external review, the reason uh, I became convinced it was worth trying was after I spent time uh, with Dr. Summers in Canada. He says it's working up here, try it. Um, so I think there are ways to harmonize. DDI, we reviewed DDI simultaneously with Canada. We approved it. Uh, on the same day. I believe in the sovereignty of, you know, the, the ultimate decision 
I think is up to, the, to, to each country. But working together to harmonize, I think the world is getting smaller, and I think we have an obligation to do that. Lastly, would you uh, tell us a little more how you're going to tell the story of the FDA, uh, what better? Uh, you started to talk on that before, and I'll use the last of my time to let you do that. We, we regulate a trillion dollars of products. The, the things we do, uh, the things we regulate, really affect um, the, the average consumer um, cares very deeply about our decisions. Um, it's the foods we eat, it's the drugs I prescribe, the drugs I give to my family, to my patients, the devices, um, the devices that we, um, we use to diagnose illnesses. People really care about what that agency uh, does. Um, you know, for the first time, we're getting fan mail. Uh, because people have to have confidence that what we care about okay, is not any particular special interest. What we care about is the average person out there and making sure that that person uh, can have safe and effective products. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Hobson. Uh, lest uh, some of our viewers or listeners uh, uh, be confused, uh, it's my understanding that THA for Alzheimer's was not approved by the agency, although under accelerated procedures, it could have been if the agency had found it to be an effective drug. Isn't that the, correct? The, the, the exact status is that it is, um, it, 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 there is a treatment IND. It's one of the types of procedures that is in effect for expanded access. So, no, you're correct, Mr. Chairman. It has not received pre-market approval, but it has, we are allowing it out for expanded access. Still, we, there's some very, the data still not, is not there yet on THA. Um, we know that there's some small statistical changes on certain of the memory uh, scales, but we don't know whether in the end there's any real clinical uh, benefit from this drug. We're hopeful that at higher doses, again at higher doses there's more of a risk of certain liver toxicity, but we have large trials underway at higher doses. We hope those uh, trials will show uh, a meaningful clinical effect, but while those trials are underway, um, we will make the drug available on an, as, as part of an expanded access, but we will also collect information. So when we look back, we'll be in a better position to answer the questions. Thank you, Dr. Gressler. Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulate you very much for holding these important hearings on an issue that is of concern to tens of millions of Americans, and I thank Dr. Kessler for joining us today. I think what we're really debating, as is often the case, is what is the proper role of government. Uh, I happen to think that Dr. Kessler heads up an agency which is perhaps one of the most sensitive in the country, uh, and it, as head of that agency, you almost have a sacred trust with the American people, because ultimately on your shoulders bears the very enormous responsibility that when somebody takes a prescription drug, somebody eats food, they have got to know that the food that they're eating, the drugs that they're taking are healthy. Your job is an extremely difficult job, but ultimately it does seem to me, Mr. Chairman, that the United States government and the United States Congress must ultimately accept the responsibility working with an agency of government to say to the American people, to the best of our knowledge, your elected representatives, the food that you're eating, the drugs that you're taking are healthy, understanding that human beings will make mistakes. But ultimately that responsibility must fall on the elected officials of this country and representatives of those like you and not on private industry, which as often as not is out to make a buck. That is the goal of many of the people in the pharmaceutical industry. That is not a great surprise. And I think also in hearing this discussion, I think we have to differentiate two areas, and I'm sure that Dr. Kessler would agree. Number one, in the areas of AIDS or breast cancer, we have a life-threatening situation. A company comes forward and they say, I have a drug, I don't know if it's going to work, it may work. And a patient and a family then may say, look, if someone is going to die in a week, why not use that drug? And I think we all understand that, and we might go forward and say, okay, let's do that. And, and I think that's a gray area, it's a difficult area, and, and we just have to do the best that we can in that area. But there's another area where I don't think the situation is the same, because we're not talking about life-threatening uh, diseases. Let me raise an issue for me, uh, coming from the state of Vermont, which has at least uh, two very uh, 
positive qualities that make me love my state. Number one, we're a dairy state. We produce milk. Uh, number two, we are very environmentally conscious. Yes. Today, uh, if she would submit that in writing uh, for response from the commissioner, because we really want to focus on this particular topic at this point. Well, okay, so let me rephrase it. But my, jobs? let me rephrase it in this sense. Okay, there have been studies done, to the best of my knowledge, Mr. Chairman which at least some articles in the Wall Street Journal a few years ago, which indicated uh, that the quality of the milk, the purity of milk that is being distributed around this country is less than what we would like it to be, that some of the milk at least has residue, residue of antibiotics in it. And I think that that is a concern uh, for all consumers. Um, under the uh, new regulations, which, which seem to be uh, that you are examining right now, uh, what impact, how would that situation be impacted? Would the FDA be more aggressive or less aggressive in making sure that chemicals used on drugs do not end up in the milk that we drink? The, Congressman, the, the recommendations, the, the subject matter of today's hearing really has to do with your former uh, points about getting drugs out in life-threatening conditions and in other conditions. Um, I certainly would be happy to discuss with you at some other time of the record what we're doing with regard to, to milk inspection. What, what you're basically saying and what I've recognized, but it's on a whole different front, is FDA needs a strong field enforcement. Uh, we need to be there. We need to do inspections. We are doing more. Uh, we still can do more. We put 25 percent additional resources into the field. But today's recommendations that we're discussing really uh, are not uh, on track for, uh, for with regard to antibiotics in milk. Let me rephrase the question. Not that I'm a lawyer here. I'm trying to, uh, to get an answer. Um, my understanding is that under these regulations, new drugs, uh, biogenetic drugs, uh, would be able to get onto the market that much quicker. Is that correct? The, the, we're dealing with the recommendations deal for drugs for human use. Uh, we obviously have a center that deals with uh, veterinary uh, health and uh, veterinary medicine as well as foods. The, this, these regulations don't apply uh, with regard to veterinary uh, drugs or with regard to foods. Uh, we, are, we are dealing with those issues on different tracks. These specific recommendations are dealing with uh, specific patient diseases and drugs for those. Right, so what you're saying is that biogenetic drugs, which might be used on an animal, which produces a product that is absorbed by a human being, is not covered in this area? The, 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 the effort to, to expedite the approval process, I mean, is really to expedite the approval process for uh, uh, human diseases, uh, that's what we're talking about in this document. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. Uh, the base, basic premise of the Quail uh, Competitiveness Council reforms is that they will save time and money. In fact, the Vice President's report asserts uh, in a quote that appears at the top of the first page. Uh, that implementation of the Council's recommendations, quote, will cut years off the review process. They will also save millions of lives and billions of dollars, close quote. In a draft memorandum to Secretary Sullivan on January 21, 1992, you wrote, quote, the opening paragraph suggests that millions of lives and billions of dollars could be saved by the reforms recommended. We and your press office attempted without success to have that removed because we did not believe it could be justified. Other data on goals for reducing approval times on estimated savings and on foreign approvals are either questionable or, in our view, inaccurate." Close quote. Do you recall writing that? Uh, I did not write that. In fact, Mr. Chairman, uh, I didn't even see that uh, uh, draft. Uh, a couple of days before this hearing uh, when I uh, heard someone said this is may uh, come up. I did not write that. It was I had never seen it. Uh, I was shown a uh, draft that was written the next day 
that I did sign, and to the best of my knowledge, it, had, it did not have those uh, paragraphs. Do you know who wrote it? I think uh, Mr. Hubbard, who's at the table here, uh, wrote it, and I'd be happy to have him. Mr. Chairman, I'm trying to give some flavor of the uncertainties in that data that was available. Um, the, you know, we're a scientific agency. We like to be able to justify those sorts of things. The, uh, the council I don't blame you. Yeah, the, the council used uh, a, a lot of information they received through a broad uh, um, advice process during that year that they worked, and, and I think they folded into their report um, uh, sources from um, information from academicians and from the government and from uh, the industry. And, and I think we were trying to reflect the fact that we, um, that it was not FDA data, uh, therefore we weren't we weren't precisely certain about its accuracy, and, and there was a debate within the agency about how um, accurate that data was. I, uh, I showed it to some folks and, and got various reactions. Um, one of our senior drug review officials thought it was unjustifiable, yet, uh, yet our, our chief economist, who's devoted 10 years to examining these things, thought that they were as good estimates as anyone could come up with. So we thought that given the fact that the uh, conclusions of the report were, were were still accurate that any any data involved in in this in this uh, report that we couldn't personally vouch for was not pertinent to the accuracy of the recommendations. I, if I, I'd be glad to give you examples if that would. Uh, Chairman, well, I, I don't need need the examples. I, I just uh, uh, note that the, the the language in that uh, draft memo is. Uh, Pretty absolute. It said they're either questionable, or the recommendations, that is, or the the, uh, the statements are either questionable or, in our view, inaccurate. Uh, the quoted language was apparently too candid uh, because it was deleted from the final memorandum, eventually sent to the secretary on uh, on January 22nd, 1992. Uh, FDA's concerns uh, suggest that the quail proposals may actually cost billions of dollars and harm millions of lives. Yet despite concluding privately that the goals of the quail proposals cannot be met, FDA is apparently in the process of implementing the quail directives. Is that correct? We are, I'm, I'm confused with the statement that accelerating drugs for life-threatening diseases is going to cost billions well, then, dollars I mean, Dr. And, Kessler, and, and, you, you, and, you and I are, you and I are, are, are uh, usually uh, more forthcoming with one another. What we're objecting to is not expediting drugs for life-threatening okay. diseases. That, that's been recommended, uh, as we'll go into in some questions, and, and there have been people in the administration sitting on it since August of 1991. Uh, what we're objecting to is taking that premise and having it apply as the Vice President's Council recommends to all kinds of diseases, life-threatening or run-of-the-mill. That's what's that's at stake in this, these recommendations. Isn't that correct? There is no intent uh, on my part to have accelerated approval apply to anything other than life-threatening or serious diseases. It doesn't make sense Never mind your intent. How about the Vice President's Council's intent? The, um, th there have been discussions with them. The, the intent is certainly to prioritize those diseases such as life-threatening or serious diseases. It makes no sense to prioritize uh, drugs for hangnails and, and warts and things. No one would advocate uh, relying on surrogate markers for those things. How do we define serious? You know, there's been some back and forth on that issue. I mean, they, they, Alzheimer's disease, I think, is very serious. Dr. Kessler, in, in the, in the uh, Quail report, uh, on page five, paragraph number two, uh, uh, examples and con of conditions that would qualify for accelerated approval are cancer, AIDS, and conditions caused by the HIV virus and cystic fibrosis. Two, drugs used to treat any condition, regardless of its severity, when the condition lacks satisfactory alternative therapy and the drug's effectiveness can be measured by appropriate surrogate endpoints or other appropriate indicators of effectiveness. Now, that's, that's part of the report, isn't it? That is part of the report, and yes. So that goes way beyond 
just accelerating it for life-threatening diseases. But look at the example given under there. The, the example given is Alzheimer's disease. I believe that Alzheimer's disease and those kinds of serious diseases should be included. Yeah, well that, that may be an example, but in fact the language is any condition for which there, there's no there, alternative I mean, therapy. How many conditions are there really where there's no, if there, if there, there are no are alternative, alternative therapy, you tell me. I mean, there must be thousands of them that we've, we've had to pass an orphan drug program. Uh, my time has expired at this point. Uh, Mr. Laura? Pardon? No, 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 I'm going to yield to you. Well, my, my question was uh, somewhat based on what the chairman was asking, is that in, in your opinion, did the original regulations uh, as proposed by the FDA go far enough uh, in, in establishing guidelines for expedited approval on important new therapies? I mean, rather than with the expanded, the original um, uh, regulations that the FDA put forward, on um, life-threatening diseases. So I, there are a lot of different recommendations here, and there are a lot of different regulations. I just, is, is we talking about accelerated approval? There was a FDA uh, originally proposed expedited review of therapies for life-threatening or seriously debilitating conditions. There was original Accelerate, FDA accelerated proposal. Accelerated approval, the conditional right. approval. Right. Okay, when that was, in your view, that was satisfactory. Uh, as a, a recommendation, uh, that there was a further expansion. Uh, my understanding was is that FDA put forward the original uh, proposal on expedited review of therapies. I think there's been some discussion back and forth about what what should be the scope, what is serious diseases, and how, how best to characterize it. Chickenpox is chickenpox a serious disease? In, in certainly not. You know, uh, when, when the average six-year-old gets chicken pox, it's not a serious disease. But when a, a child who's immunosuppressed gets chicken pox, uh, it is a very serious disease and it is potentially life-threatening. And I think we've been working on language uh, to make sure that, that uh, it does include uh, a broad range of life-threatening and serious diseases. I think it's. A, I think it's. We're dealing with an issue of words. Uh, of wordsmithing here, because certainly, as the chairman points out, Alzheimer's disease, I consider life-threatening as serious, and I think should be included. Well, but the, the chairman also talked about there are other other diseases do, do out I there for do which I there are not the alternatives. Be included. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the average what? No, absolutely not. Do I believe that laryngeal wart should be included? Absolutely. So scleroderma? Scleroderma is definitely a uh, life-threatening uh, yes. disease. Yes. Scleroderma is a life-threatening disease. I've asked the question Systemic earlier. Systemic sclerosis. Mm -hmm. Yes. I've asked the question earlier of under the new procedure, would there be an expedited review of scleroderma? If we're not talking about a process here today that makes recommendations, um, uh, to expedite a process for life-threatening diseases, Absolutely. then my question is, again, on, with, with regard to scleroderma, is, is that would be under the new procedure up for expedited review. It's now almost, it's over two years with regard to scleroderma, is my understanding of it. You may know better. Scleroderma certainly I would characterize mm -hmm. within the scope of accelerated mm -hmm. approval. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. The, earlier this morning, Dr. Wolf's testimony, um, in the survey that was conducted, they talked about, uh, an answer to one of the questions was um, it, with regard to farming out reviews to non-FDA reviewers, why not hire more internal reviewers and provide incentives to stay on board with their, um, um, when their expertise matures? I asked him uh, the, the question of had there been any uh, review of, of cost estimates uh, with regard to this kind of a procedure in, in terms of building that expertise internally in, in your shop versus going outside. Uh, have you taken a look at that kind of a proposal? What does it cost to do an external um, uh, re review and are you taking a look at the cost benefit uh, right. analysis there? First, we want to build in the expertise in-house. That's very important. Right. Uh, there, not everybody is willing, not every expert is willing to come work 
uh, for the federal government. Some people are living elsewhere in this country. Uh, the question is, can we tap into the scientific infrastructure of this country uh, appropriately? Yes, we've done some cost estimates, but we're actually part, you know, we're, we're, you know we are part of a contracting process in those cost estimates, I would be happy to share those confidentially so I don't bias the contracting out. Uh, I, if we tell people what, what our cost estimates are, they will know how to bid. Uh, so I don't want to do that mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. But we'd be happy to we share happy that to make that confidentially available the to, the, uh, to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Loro. Uh, one of the FD, uh, one of the quail proposals, uh, Dr. Kessler, that, that FDA is implementing calls for review of new drug applications by groups outside of FDA. FDA would retain final approval authority, but would ordinarily make its decision solely upon the report from the outside group who certifies that the data establishes safety and efficacy. Isn't it true that under the Council's proposal, FDA would not be able to examine the actual data unless you suspected that the external review was somehow inadequate. Mr. Chairman, th there were many different iterations and many different proposals for external review. The first was a scenario, scenario that I found unacceptable. It was an underwriter's laboratory scenario. The second one was a scenario like the SEC model. I found that unacceptable. The third one would be to allow drug companies to go have expert external review and go be able to buy their external review. We won't have any control. What we did, we rejected all those proposals and ultimately the Competitiveness Council rejected those proposals. What we have come up with was a model of to try 8 to 12 reviews to be able to, the, 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 the main difference between those earlier proposals that we rejected and what we, what's in this report is that FDA maintains full control over those reviewers. We pay for them, we des decide who they are, and we decide what work they do. No, we do not want to reduplicate. The whole purpose is not to reduplicate uh, their work, and we will not do that. We want to pick qualified people who can begin some of the studies in the backlog areas until we can get to them. Dr. Kessler, on page three of the Quail Report, uh, at the second paragraph at the top of the page, it says, FDA will also retain the right to fully review the clinical data supporting the external reviews and perform its own review when there is an indication that the external review has not been properly performed. However, in the usual case, FDA will not repeat the work of the external review ent entity. I see that language. Let, let me, uh, Mr. Chairman, let, let me let Dr. Burlington take you through Please. the realities of what actually gets done, what we anticipate to happen during this external review process. But uh, Dr. Kessler, you were, you were the one who served on the working group, and Dr. Burlington, I assume, did not. You were not on the working group. But, but Dr. Burlington right? did design, understand this process. What happened here, Mr. Chairman, was the competitors, some people on the Competitors Council put out an idea. I thought the idea didn't have merit and ultimately yeah. they didn't. Sec they put out several other ideas. The ultimate idea, the ultimate proposal of 8 to 12 was designed by Dr. Peck with Dr. Burlington and then we submitted that to the Competitiveness Council. He designed with the, the, the proposal that we submitted. Well, you know, it, it, sort, of, it sort of reminds me of the Talmud. Well, you can't just read the text, you have to read the commentaries. And Dr. Burlington is about to provide us some commentaries. I don't think we needed. What I'm pointing out is that if somebody looks at that text, I think you've got problems in, in, in what you're going to be reviewing. According to the documents that we have, the White House attempted to withhold from the sub, that, that the White House attempted to withhold from the subcommittee, you quote, strenuously objected to the Council's external review proposals. However, the version of the Council's report that noted your strong objection to this proposal was never released to the public. Isn't that true? The version of the, of the uh, report, of the Council's report, that noted your strong objections to this proposal for external review. Uh, pages 6 through 8 of the unpublished Council report notes that Dr. Kessler, quote, strenuously objected to the proposal and says that the working group reached unanimous 
a consensus only on the other recommendations. Mr. Chairman, this, we're, there's some misunderstandings here. What I strenuously objected to was certain proposals such as delegating out all reviews, lacking all control, the whole underwriter's laboratory model, I rejected. I objected strenuously to that. I objected strenuously to an external review model that said, okay, drug companies could go out and buy their review from whoever they want. I objected very strenuously to that. But then I went, and as I said, I spoke to, uh, we, we sat, we talked with Canada, I spoke to Carl Peck, and certain of our people said, gee, you know, there are certain things we'd like to try. Dr. Burlington, Dr. Peck sat down, they put together a proposal uh, for 8 to 12 uh, uh, applications that we would maintain control, and I fully support that. It was the earlier proposals that I very strenuously objected to, having, and they were ultimately rejected. Haven't you also noted that external review, quote, could well slow down reviews of new drugs and decrease the quality and credibility of those reviews. Ex exactly, Mr. Chairman, and that's why we, that the earlier proposals would have done that. That's why we limited the current proposals to the area of backlog, because it's, I mean, if we can't get to an application for 12 months, if it's sitting there, okay, it's certainly better to have someone start some of the analyses get that underway, and then we can review that. That's why we designed the ultimate proposal the way it was, so it would not uh, slow down. It will speed it up. It was the earlier proposals that I objected to well, very strenuously. I must, I must tell you, this is in a, memo, in a memo dated August 1, 1991. We wrote this memorandum to the chair of the council's working group. Uh, you indicated the latest re draft recommendations include most of my concerns and it has major problems, could well slow down reviews of new drugs and decrease the quality and credibility of those reviews. Mr. Chairman, uh, with, you know, this is one of the first times, I think, I think that uh, you have it wrong to be very... Uh, uh, what, what do I have wrong? Because w that was written on August 1st. Right. Okay. And I objected to several proposals that were on the table very strenuously. I then turned after August 1st, I mean, I turned to uh, the center people. And I heard from the center people that they wanted to try certain things. They came forward with certain proposals that I thought di did merit tr uh, uh, trying. We submitted it to the Competitiveness Council. The Competitiveness Council incorporated the proposals on external review that our people in the Center for Drugs came up with. You also con expressed concerns about being forced to rely on data summaries rather than the actual data. You wrote, quote, I'm very concerned our ability under such a scheme to audit the reliability of drug application data. We must be alert to problems that occasionally occur with regard to fraudulent data submissions and to information being withheld from reviewers. I was very opposed to giving up control of the process to external review bodies that were not within our control, to have other people go out and buy their reviews from sources that we did not pick, that we didn't specify how they to do their work. When we, we redesigned the proposal, but okay, then you, you completely, have to, but I mean, then you, it, it have, you have to go over the work of those external reviewers, and that's the very point that had been raised earlier by you that in fact this might very well end up. Uh, slowing down rather than speeding the approval but, but the of new reason, drugs. The, the way we solve that problem, the, 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 the way I, the, the reason why the, the, the final proposals I don't think do that was we, we said external review should only be limited to the areas where there's a backlog. If we can get to that application for six months or a year, that we need, so, why don't we have people start on that application? External review, the, 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 the proposal, Okay, that's in the Competitiveness Council is vastly different from the proposals that you're referring to or that I objected to. Unless, the, the, the language again that I had read to you before, that paragraph two at the top of page three, says that you have to have some indication that the external review has not been properly performed in order for you to be able to repeat to the work of the external review entity and uh, 
uh, go at it. So you, you're still limited, according to this report, to looking at summaries rather than looking at the data itself. Mr. Chairman, let, let me assure you, okay, that we will implement the external review concept in, in a way we will, for these 8 to 12, we will try it in a way that maximizes our control and maximizes our ability to have confidence in the result. It may work, it may not work. That's why we, we want to try it. There was, the reason I signed on to this was because the senior leadership in drugs said, let's try this. The reason I signed on to this was I heard it was very successful in Canada. I didn't write every single word in the Competitiveness Council, but we did propose, we proposed okay, the, 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 the whole notion of 8 to 12 in the areas of backlog as long as we had control over the process. And Dr. Burlington's in charge with Dr. Peck of making sure that it works. How we implement this, I agree with you, Mr. Chairman, it's very important that it be implemented thoughtfully. You also informed the Council that the external review proposal cannot be implemented in the near term because qualified external organizations do not exist and will require some years to develop. Isn't that correct? We, we, that was one of our concerns, but unless we go forward, unless we see what's out there, and we will by putting out a request, we are, putting, we are working on a request right now. We'll see what's out there. There are certainly very sophisticated, uh, enormously talented clinical pharmacologists that may want to do this, that may be of enormous. We need to, you know, the, the, the note, we need to link with the scientific infrastructure of the, this nation. Uh, we need to be able to have the best possible talent. It may work, Mr. Chairman. It may not work. All we're saying is we want to try. The Department of Health and Human Services has noted that in addition to the fact that these outside groups do not yet exist, FDA would have to, quote, divert enormous energy and resources to developing guidance and criteria against which to judge and certify the entities. Isn't that true? We or Mr. Chairman, we already have, we've already used external reviewers uh, that we control in a number of instances. Uh, we want to do it in a little more systematic way and we want to see whether it works. It may take enormous resources, it may not work, it may prove very valuable. I hear from Canada, okay, the, the, they went through the same kind of debate before they tried it. It was very rocky, people raised the same kinds of questions. Uh, Dr. Summers says it is on balance, been a success, uh, it's improved uh, their, uh, uh, their review process. We, we want to try it. It, it, it. it may not work, it may work, but you know, I see no harm. I see it only, we need to be able to innovate. We need to be able to, to look at new ways of managing uh, better. We just can't say you know, that the way we, we've done it is perfect. Of course, you're not the only one who had expressed concerns uh, about uh, external review. Uh, are you aware that Dr. Carl Peck the highest ranking official under the commissioner responsible for approving new drugs has written, quote, my first reservation here is embracing the idea of out-contracting NDA clinical reviews. This was written by him in a June 14, 1991 memorandum. He did write that, but it was in response to the privatization model for all drugs not within FDA's control. Dr. Peck designed the proposal that was ultimately adopted by the Competitiveness Council. He did object strenuously, as I did, to the notion that we should have an underwriter's laboratory kind of model, that drug companies should be able to go buy their review. He, he thought it was a good idea. He came up with it. He said to me, I remember vividly where I was. We were at my house. He said, David, I want to try it. I want to try it, but I want to be able to maintain control. Uh, Ms. Porter, isn't it true that FDA's Office of General Counsel has concluded that the Council's external review proposals, proposal is not legal in an opinion rendered on October 17, 1991 by FDA Attorney Linda Horton. 
That is not correct, Mr. Chairman. The analysis that Ms. Horton did, again, as Dr. Kessler indicated, was based on an earlier concept of external review. The external review proposals, as finally announced by the Council, are legally supportable because the Commissioner, the Secretary, and the Commissioner retain the statutory authority to, for final decision making. When was the, the uh, Quail report released? I believe November 13th. And the uh, legal opinion rendered by Linda Horton was October 17, 1991, and I quote from it. Uh, the Quail proposal, quote, could not be implemented under current law, but would require new legislation to the extent that the proposal limits FDA's ability to make a meaningful decision. This proposal would be inconsistent with the statute. If the agency were to adopt such a proposal, and the scheme were challenged in court, the legal defense would, would be difficult to construct and it would be very likely to be struck down by the reviewing court. Now, you, you don't deny that, in fact, that, that was her, her statement. Absolutely not, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Horton pr uh, prepared that analysis at my request. <coughs> Uh, at the time that the f after the final proposals were, were developed, we also did an analysis. We concluded that the final proposals, in fact, are supportable on the sta under the statute, again for the, for the reason that I stress, which is that under the final proposals, recommendations, external review will by be by contract, which is already done under the existing statute. FDA retains control to designate, to review, and to accept or reject the recommendations of the external reviewers. That process is authorized under the current statute. Well, that, that, that statement is, is included in, in uh, Ms. Horton's uh, statement in her memoranda, and yet she still comes to the conclusion that I've just quoted. Uh, Dr. Kessler, isn't it a fact that prior to the Council's activities, uh, FDA had rejected the idea of pursuing external review of drug applications. In December 1990, FDA staff noted three previous committees that had recommended external review of drug applications. Your staff indicated that this advice was, quote, not implemented, experimentation with this indicated learning curve and conflict of interest uh, problems. Uh, you know, in, in reviewing the documents for this hearing, I saw one, uh, was it John Harder? I mean, certain of our, of our review division directors wanted uh, to try uh, this. Uh, wanted, and that was one of the reasons why, in the end, we proposed and we came up. Uh, there's never, you know, in any large organization, uh, there's, there's, the process, Mr. Chairman, worked here. I mean, the, 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 what, what needs to be recognized is that there's a back and forth, there's a give and take. We, 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 we wanted to push the envelope of drug development, we wanted to manage it better. People came up with different ideas. We felt uncomfortable with those ideas. We came up with an idea ourselves. The council bought it. I mean, w again, is there a, is everyone think it's a, a perfect idea? I mean, we'll, ha we'll have to see, we'll have to test. Anytime there's any change, there's some resistance uh, to that. I can tell you, it's not, I mean, we've, I've learned that firsthand over the last 17 months. Anytime you do anything new, there is some who insist on the status quo. But the, the, the proposal on external review for 8 to 12 was something that was designed ultimately in the end by us and was, was accepted by the Competitiveness Council. The process, actually, the process worked in this instance. Yes, Mr. Laura, of course. What is your system in place to deal with the issue of the issues of data fraud and conflict of interest, given the new recommendations? How are you going to deal with that process? What mechanisms are designed in order for you to find that out with this more of an arm's length right. um, uh, position? The conflict of interest, we have developed a lot of experience um, over the last couple of years because we have used one external reviewers um, in a limited fashion and, and we have developed a lot of sophistication with regard to conflict of interest because we use advisory committee members yeah. and the same kind of conflict of interest uh, rules will apply in this case. In fact, under the external review, it's my understanding that, that our first attempt at this is to go out 
uh, to make sure um, the, the contractors will have no conflict of interest. We're not going to do this unless we can assure that there's no conflict of interest. We may in the end not be able to do this because it may end up being that all experts have conflict of interest. So, but we, we're going to try that. Th there is, with regard to the auditing of data, the, the most important thing is that we end up picking, they're within our control. Uh, we will have to audit uh, their work, just in the same way that a supervisory person uh, who uh, audits uh, the results of uh, in a, a medical reviewer. And uh, that's not going to add additional time to the process, it, it, in it, your view? It, it, it may, okay? But the issue is, if you're not going to get to an application for a year, it's going to sit on someone's desk. If that application for scleroderma is sitting on a reviewer's desk for a year, and they have seven other applications that they have to do. The issue is, should someone start work on that application? Should someone start uh, start the basic analyses. Yes, it may add an extra week of going back to check, but you may gain a year for that extra week's worth of work. I don't know whether it'll work or not. The we issue is try. not whether or not the backlog will be, it, it shouldn't be dealt with in a specific way, but as, I, as it is being dealt with, what are the safeguards and what kind of mechanisms uh, and authorities do you have to ensure that, uh, that the, the safety and, uh, or that the review process or data fraud or conflict of interest are not occurring if you have a limited control of that process. That's what the, the issue is, not tackling a backlog. I think everyone would agree that there ought to be procedures for dealing with a, a tackling of a backlog or maybe dealing with it internally rather than with an external I, I, I review. I, I understand your question. The, the, the Division of Scientific Integrity will still have primary responsibility for auditing that data. That does not change in this case. All data has to be audited. It's one of the, the important lessons that we've learned over the last couple of years. We can't rely on an honor system anymore. We have to do uh, those audit checks. We have to do them more often. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you back. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you know, we, we've been in the course of your testimony, you mentioned uh, DDI and, and uh, uh, you mentioned other concerns for, for life-threatening diseases. Now, isn't it a fact that last year FDA drafted a proposed regulation that would accelerate the approval of drugs for life-threatening or serious diseases? The rationale behind the proposal is that drugs should be approved to treat diseases like AIDS and cancer with less evidence of safety and efficacy than is normally required for conditions that are not as serious. You signed off on that draft and forwarded it to HHS for approval on August 30th of 1991. Has anything happened to it? What's happened since? It is, um, I think it's almost ready uh, for release, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me assure you that we've not waited. Uh, we can't wait for the formal policy. It, you know, it takes time uh, for formal policies to be developed. What well, we did well, my, my we, point we codified that, my, my by DDI. My point is that that, that particular policy for life-threatening diseases has been recommended by you and here HHS and the administration have been sitting on it for over six months at this stage. Now, the Quail Council recommended that the accelerated approval concept be greatly expanded to include, quote, drugs used to treat any condition regardless of its severity. When the condition lacks satisfactory alternative therapy and the drug's effectiveness can be measured by appropriate su surrogate endpoints. Now, my, uh, Ms. 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 Porter, you wrote that to suggest that any illness with no alternative therapy may be serious is disingenuous, will cause the agency to lose credibility. Now, it, it seems to me that the reason that the administration has been sitting on the life-threatening regulation is because they wanted to use it as a hook for deregulation, for, for accelerated review for any condition, which is what, what the re council report calls for. Isn't, isn't it fair to draw that conclusion? Mr. Chairman, please judge us by the final regulation. It, 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 my understanding is it will come out soon. Our intent is to expedite things for diseases that really we care about. 
judge us by the final regulations. Oh, my question, my concern is, is, as you know, not you, Dr. Kessler. I have the highest faith and confidence in you. But I know, having sat in this chair for nine years now, uh, the pressures that commissioners of FDA are placed under by an administration which hates regulation with a vengeance and which Mr. Quayle has said that they are the enemy of the, of the aggressive regulators. And that's really what I'm concerned. I'm concerned about the usurpation of your powers and responsibilities. Uh, it's clear to me that the Quayle proposals are not penny wise, but pound foolish and medically foolish. Uh, it's clear that, the, that, that they may jeopardize public health if fully implemented. The external review plan is designed to prevent FDA from scrutinizing safety data. The IRB proposal will subject human volunteers to untested drugs based upon a review by unqualified outside groups according to the documents that we received. And the White House accelerated approval plan will force FDA to approve drugs for any condition, not just life-threatening illnesses, based on only preliminary evidence of safety and efficacy. Uh, in my judgment, and as we've seen today, there's a reason to believe that these initiatives may well slow down drug approvals while exposing consumers unnecessarily to dangerous drugs. FDA officials have voiced their concerns, yet find themselves being pressured by the White House to implement the Council's drastic changes in the drug approval pro process. And I find it profoundly disturbing that the e experts at FDA are in fact being held hostage to the political desires of the White House. If FDA is not allowed to operate with the independence that it is entitled to under federal law, then the public health will suffer. Uh, it, I appreciate uh, the difficulty of your role. I truly do. I think that you have done a magnificent job in trying to reassert the vitality and effectiveness of, of, of FDA. And the effort of this subcommittee uh, will continue to be make sure that you are allowed to do your job as Congress intended uh, that it be done. I very much appreciate your participation today, and I wish you success in your continued efforts. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kessler. The subcommittee now stands adjourned, subject to the call of the chair. Good morning from the nation's capital. You're watching C-SPAN 2.